All right, we're back on the record. This is the new cases for the zoning calendar for November 14, 2017. Item number one, 196.15 BC, 250 Mercer Street, Manhattan, received as submission. Uh, I passed out in front of you and oh, Elise Fuladere from Eric Palatnik, BC, on behalf of the applicant who's here with me today. I passed out a affidavit in support from the fire um, and security company that puts in the fire alarm system. And I also have a revised plans that I'll go through with you in a second. The proof of service we sent yesterday in a submission. I, I mean, we the, the initial yeah, filing. That I saw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm just reading the affidavit as you speak. Oh, okay. sorry. Um, yeah, okay. So the PCE square footage was correct on the plans and the zoning analysis form is 3,593 square feet. Um, so uh, the DOB notation you wanted is now on the BSA 200 and BSA 300 facility to be equipped with sprinkler system is approved by DOB. And in the second notice of comments, we handed out that the sprinkler system had passed. So that's the thing. So. Um you say shall be installed, but there were photos that yeah. said it was installed. Yeah, I, I just thought this was the, yeah. installed sprinkler. It was installed, so I just I, I thought this was the. It, 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 I don't know. Oh, this is the fire, not sprinkler. No, I'm. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Now you're talking about this is fire. No, I'm, oh. I'm talking about your sprinkler comment. Yeah. Right. So if, I was just using notes that we've used in the past, if you want okay. me to say. So that's the thing about tenses. Yeah. Either it happened already or okay. it will happen. So it will happen. Our equipped. Happen already, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I will ask them to. Parlance, even yeah. Esperanto, apparently. Okay. I was just going with PCE <laughs> notes that we've seen before, so I was just trying right. to keep okay. it consistent. So tenses should reflect reality. Okay. okay. R, yes. Okay. And so, um, but so this. The drawings say it, but we don't have any sign of an, an approval of the sprinklers. That's just so confusing. Like, In the second notice of comments, we sent something from the DOB that said it passed the sprinklers. I can resubmit it. Oh, so that's a that's a DOB, the biz? Y yeah, we looked on DOB, and it says it passed sprinklers. Oh, okay. But maybe I didn't see that. I didn't see that, so okay. maybe resubmit. I can resubmit that, okay. but... Um, it, we submitted it in this. This had two rounds of notices of comments. Okay. Um, and then I do see your affidavit, but it says the alarms will be installed. It's so in this affidavit. They had a difficulty. They tr the letter hasn't really been working for people, so they put in the um, all the fire yeah. alarm connectors and stuff, but they haven't installed them in completion because they they, they couldn't. Wait, so I'm I'm confused. I know that there was a problem with the fire department because of inspections, not no, getting that not notice getting, of they're completion. They're not getting permits to put in fire alarms because they don't have the PCE special permit, and our letter from the sufficient. So they're the not getting. So it can, I don't know if you can explain this, but mm -hmm. so there, the board provides DOB with this letter, mm -hmm. and the DOB has been okay with allowing the fire alarm to be installed but we understood it was the fire department that had some sort of an issue not the DOB remember right the fire, fire department fire yeah. permits for fire alarms. but fire no DOB issues the permit the fire department is the one about the inspection because we were saying, this is, this is my understanding, fire department is not here. My understanding is that DOB issues the permit, to win, which we know is the case because we see that on the permits, right? Mm -hmm. DOB issues the permit to install the fire alarm. They've been getting a letter from us saying, please allow this to proceed. Yeah. Right? But it's the fire department. Then we usually ask for more than that. We ask that it be scheduled for inspection with the fire department. Mm -hmm. Well, we understand, and we're going to be talking to fire department tomorrow, tomorrow actually. Yeah. What we understand is fire department has not been allowing it to be scheduled for, for inspection because DOB won't issue some kind of notice of no objection notice yeah. or something like that, right? So, but meanwhile... This architect it, ran into more problems, I guess. It, this, started, this case started in 2015, I don't know. Right, so, so that's my question yesterday was this started in 2015 mm -hmm. when we didn't have in place this agreement with DOB. So what I can't tell from your materials is whether, um, so 
sort of the architect abandoned this effort or whoever the fire installer, alarm installer abandoned this effort <coughs> way back in 2015 when they didn't get approval. I think they were continuously having problems and that's why they put in the connectors and everything. But. So can you find out, because I don't know that we've ever given this letter, a letter to DOB that about this will. site. Oh, no, we, we have. We spoke uh, yeah, we did, at length before this approval, this application got put on the schedule because she was having problems with That was a different case, actually. Oh, I'm sorry. It's just it's similar also, issues. Like oh, no, oh, but we also spoke about another case that'll be on next month that was also having the same okay. issue. So, so this, so to clarify again, did 250 Mercer receive a letter from us? We did provide you with a letter. Yeah, but it, the, these letters are not, we've no, been going back. No, when, but when was the letter provided? In November, I believe, or last month, uh, uh, recently. It was... A few weeks ago. Sorry, I don't know. No, it was, it was done in, in late August. Or, or late August, oh, so, sorry. So, okay, so the that letter was wasn't effective in late August. Okay. So that's kind of the problem we have with all these legalizations. Right. Yeah, um, but the letter, I got another letter, sorry, I'm from confusing the cases for another case a little bit after that, and that also, we're going back and forth, me and Laura, and we're having problems. So what I'd like to do, um, because again, these are legalizations, and we're trying to get the fire alarms installed, and we have a call tomorrow with the fire department with lots of different fire fighters <coughs> or whatever. Um, <laughs> uh, what I'd like to do is see if we can work something out tomorrow with the fire department and with DOB so that this letter is actually effective because it was effective for a while. It was working. And then what we understood was fire department was holding it up for inspection, which is a different subject than simply installing the alarm. Because okay. right now all you have is wiring yeah. and nothing more, right? So it and means just the space is not alarmed and that's not safe. Um, especially in this kind of uses where you've got um, you've got heat sources, you've got things that can catch fire. Actually. And they and yeah, and they tried multiple times, but yeah, they had issues. So right, okay. So we're problem. trying to clear this up, and so we could we could put this on for um, continuation, not too long from now, and um, because it's really only this issue I think that's open, right? So, um, are there any speakers on this? Okay. So, well, actually, how about, let's see, if we put this on for just for argument's sake for a month from now, the, the only thing that we would know is whether or not you can, you can get the permits, right? So that's all you'll be telling us is if, this, if our conversation with fire department and DOB works out. Right? Mm -hmm. and that, that sounds like that would work. And then, and then, assuming you can get permits as opposed to them not working anything out with us, then we can, um, then you'll have to finish the installation. Okay? Okay, so I follow up with L'Oreal. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, so is it useful to put it on for a month from now? Maybe. Or is it more know. useful to put it on two months from now and yeah. then maybe have the permits and have it installed? Yeah. Okay. okay. It's also up to you. Yeah. Right. So this is um, this a opened in this <laughs> opened. The by the way, it opened two years ago. No, so it opened two really, months ago. No, no, no 10, 10, 16, oh, but we've been in. We've been opened. through multiple notices of comments. That's right. Why. But it also uh, no. But it, in in fairness, it also was the application was submitted in August. I mean, sorry, yeah, in August of 2015, and it opened in October. So it wasn't as if it was going to actually go through the normal review process anyway, right? That's the reality. Right? Nice try, but okay. <laughs> okay, so let's put it on then for, let's say, January 30th. Does yeah. that, sound? that gives you enough time to get permits, install, et cetera, right? December 30th? January 30th. January 30th. January 30th, yeah. So that's the a submission on January 10th, but if you show us that it's been installed just immediately before January 30th, that's okay too. Okay, thank you very much. Item number 2, 2016-4153-BZ, 4701 19th Avenue, Brooklyn. Good evening, Eric Blatnick and Jessica Rubenstein, who's going to be doing a lot of talking, and Ruth Lichtenstein, a project witness, and more people. 
-hmm. Thanks for hearing us. Uh, we have a great application that's before you, one that's very dear to my heart. Uh, you heard uh, Councilman, uh, the Councilman, dating myself 20 years, State Senator Simcoff Felder speak about it. Uh, what we're here for you today is a school cultural resource center and a religious use all wrapped up into one. It's, uh, it's called Project Witness. Ruth Lichtenstein, Lichtenstein is here today, and right there, just raised her hand, is uh, the executive uh, director. She's also the editor of Hamadia. Hamadia, am I pronouncing that correctly? Which is the largest Yiddish newspaper, right, in, in North America, or English in North America. She'll give you more, but the point is, is Ruth is a big shot in Borough Park. And she's well known as being a, a scholar and, uh, and a very highly literate. And she noticed about 20 years ago, as we've all noticed and it's been discussed, that there was the largest Holocaust surviving population in Borough Park in America, outside of Israel. And she noticed they were dying. <coughs> and she saw what was happening or was going to happen in our world as time went on, almost what we're all seeing today in the news every single day. And she realized that unless she makes a record of this and creates a collegiate level educational resource program, which has never been done in the world before. As a young Jewish man, I learned about the Holocaust. They showed us gruesome images. Just a second. Yep, sure. Otherwise, we won't be able to hear you. Nice to have a moment of silence in the Yeah, room. isn't it? It's kind of nice. <laughs> so Ruth really did a great thing, and she's created a, a collegiate, up to a collegiate level, everything from grade school through collegiate level accredited educational program on the Holocaust that doesn't speak to the gruesomeness of it, but speaks to the social motives and, and the climate and the political cultures that caused it to rise, caused the events to occur, and documents the events that occurred from a historical perspective, very well documented at a level that could be studied and is studied in universities, high schools, colleges, grade schools, elementary schools throughout the city, throughout the state, throughout the country, and she's spreading to throughout the world. I myself am an ambassador on the program where I go out to public schools and try and introduce her program to the schools so that they'll adopt it and teach it in their schools. And it's being taught in states that you wouldn't even imagine that are far less progressive than New York State, and that it's being incorporated. And she's very well, very well inscribed in the New York City uh, movement on the Holocaust. And every, uh, people like Simcha Felder and like David Greenfield, who's a representative of his office here today, uh, people like that, that run the Holocaust Museum, all recognize who Ruth is and they all know what she's doing. So what, would we, what are we doing here? How does this come to the variance? We're here for an educational school religious-based resource center. What this building is, and it's very modest for the variances we've asked you for. I'm sure you've had a chance to look at the plans. We're on a corner. We're subject to cockamamie R5 corner regulations, which you all know what I mean when I say cockamamie. We're required to have 10-foot front yards on the corner. It's an existing one-story building. If we built as of right the second floor, you're left with a sliver of a second floor between the, the eight-foot yard you need to the neighbor on one side, the 10-foot front yards you need on each side. You're left with almost nothing. You can't add on to this building. We're essentially asking you the permission to vary all those yards, which are cockamamie yards to begin with. Because if you look at all the buildings next to us, we're really asking to build a rectangle just like every other building next to us. And it's because we're on a corner that we have the 10-foot front yard requirements. And we're asking for a few feet in height. But the reason we're, and we're asking for floor area. I, should, I shouldn't belittle the floor area. That's the most substantial request. Uh, we're entitled to have 4,600. We're asking for 7,000. So we're asking for 2,500 more square feet. But to the average person walking down the street, they're not going to really notice the floor area that we're looking at. Because the building is going to stand at a height of 38 feet, which is fairly analogous to the building we included in our streetscape. But if you look at the pictures, three doors to our right, there's a three-story building that people live in. It's a normal building that somebody built to profit and make money off of, and they sold the units, and people are living in it. And it's about the same height as us. There's a car wash behind us. There's nothing really. We're not like in the middle of uh, disturbing anything. But what we are doing is we're adding. And I'm sure you've seen the letters of support. They've come in. There have been some letters of opposition, but a lot of letters of support. And the basic premise of what we do here is uh, people like uh, Sarah Boken, who's here, who's the dean of the new seminary, and she's right here. 
And people like her have seen what Ruth is doing, and she's partnered with universities and colleges such as Adelphi, and they've created programs so that any student, you, me, anybody, could walk into Ruth Lichtenstein and could, could sit with, with the new seminary, could take classes, and could earn college credits. And they could earn that while learning about the Holocaust. Also what happens here, uh, people, uh, the, the Muslim community, as a matter of fact, which I have a mosque that I'm representing later today. It's like the United Nations around here today for us. Uh, the Muslim community is very involved with Ruth. She does a lot of work with them, uh, teaching about the Holocaust. And they're taking a huge effort in because of the pressures that the Muslim community is now facing. I'm sure all of you read in the papers two days yesterday about what happened in Bay Ridge with all the windows being broken in the Muslim American society. So this, these things that are happening are prevalent, and they're no longer just stuck to one group. The Jews, we used to be the big targets. I'm a Jew, it was a big target. Now there's so many ethnic groups and they're all targets. So what Ruth is doing is Ruth is out there educating everybody so that the memory of what, not what happened at the Holocaust, not the brutality of it, but what led to it, which is eerily ironic, similar to what's occurring today, doesn't happen again in the future. And that's why we're asking you for the parent. It's not so we can make money, not so that we could build some big edifice to our egos, but so we could build a space that Ruth could bring school children in that might not know about the Holocaust, because they don't, because they're kids, and she could teach them, and she has a great program to do that. And that's what we're here for today. That's the whole thing. A side benefit of what she does, of her resources, is she's interviewed, and it's, this is quite fascinating. If you ever want to come by and meet with her and, and see what she's all about, if you're fascinated or interested in any of this stuff, she's happy to have you. She's interviewed, I don't know how many survivors, and she's created a resource center where she's got these interviews on video. So you can go in there and actually watch what people went through and learn from it. And she's created full-length feature movies about this, about the Holocaust and about experiences people had. But again, none of it in a gruesome way. None of it in any of the stuff that I, as a young man, as a Jew, saw and was exposed to. I've been reading her books now for the last seven months, six months. I haven't seen one picture that's grotesque. It's not about that. It's about educating people. So that's why we're here today. That's why State Senator Simka Felder took so much time out of his day to sit here and wait. That's why David Greenfield's office is here today. And I don't want to give Danny Perlstein short credit, I, short, short shrift. I keep calling David Greenfield, but Danny Perlstein is here. Uh, so that's our presentation. Jessica Rubenstein is going to speak to uh, the specifics of the project, the program, in a little while. But before she does, we'd like to, uh, if it's okay with you, have Ruth Lichtenstein come up and speak for just a minute so she could tell you a little bit more about uh, the operations. Before we go to Ruth, though, one quick thing. I know the board had a question yesterday about ownership, and I'm sure it's biting on Madam Chair's brain cells somewhere that Palatnik, you're speaking about all this stuff, but I have a fundamental question before you get to the, the, you know, the, the story. So you understand, you, I saw that you saw online that you thought there was a zoning lot declaration development agreement between the properties. No, it's a zoning lot description and ownership statement. Right, that's what it, that's what it was. That was done, the properties are all owned by one entity, uh, Congregation Zikron Yehuda is, is the name. They own our building and the building to the right. I forget the address of the building to the right. They own both. There was a plan or thought at some point, years past, that they were gonna do something with both properties. One development. They've since decided not to. So our property is 4701, is separate. It's being leased by Project Witness from the congregation. The congregation also owns the property next door. And they're going to be developing that as their own shul as time goes on in the future, independent of project witness. It's confusing because a lot of the people are similar people, are the same people that are involved in both organizations. And it's basically a subsidiary. It would be the same thing as General Motors, and then you've got Ford and you've got Chevy. Or, no, excuse me, you've got Chevy and Buick. Ford is not part of General Motors. So, but, so concept, it's, but it's not that ownership is actually confusing because we can look up on ACRIS and see who the owners are, so it's very clear that the owners are Zikran Yehuda, right? Um, and it's also very clear that it's one zoning lot because it was declared to be one zoning lot in the zoning lot description and ownership statement. That's actually what the buildings department uses to determine... No, but that was never filed. Only a description was filed. Right. It was never so, actually... It was no, no, no. the exhibit three. Sorry, was... sorry. It's exhibit three. It's filed with the filed with the buildings department. The buildings department uses that to determine what a zoning lot is. That's why they require owners to file those things with the buildings department. What is the size of the zoning lot? They ask, and the and then um, sort the sorry the title company is the one that 
creates is a certification of parties and interest, and there's a zoning lot description and an ownership statement, both of which state that, because that's all that's necessary when you're the owner. You only need a zoning lot declaration right. when there's two owners, right? But when you're the owner, you, you, you state that I am the owner of record of this zoning lot, and now it's one zoning lot. So in order to subdivide the zoning lot, you actually have to file for a zoning lot subdivision. So the, the main question is, given that the zoning lot is 44 feet wide, and given that you've got um, two uses that are not incompatible, so you've, you've got two uses that are not incompatible that can take advantage of a 44 foot wide site, why can't there be, for example, synagogue on the ground floor that you can double the use of because when um, Project Witness needs to use it for the space for yeah, no, that's, some something or other, it could use that space. I, I see where you're going, and we don't, we don't mean to, first of all, okay. we're going to speak to more on the zoning lot, but that's not the program that everybody has envisioned for, for the sites. That's not what they're, but they're so, trying to do. But this you're is, asking us to look at a zoning... So no, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, he's going to explain. Zoning. If I could just have okay. one speaker. Let... Please state your name. Good afternoon, Menachem Moster. Um, I'm, I, I was, I'm a project manager for Gregory Zinkovich. We originally filed the job for both of the properties. We were the applicant of record on both of the properties. That was 4701 and 4703. Um, back at the time when we Sorry, filed... Sorry, who did you represent as the applicant of record? Gregory Zinkovich. That's the... He's an, the architect in our office. Oh, oh so you're, you're working with the architect. I'm okay. project so manager. Project manager from the architect. Correct. Okay. okay. And so, right, okay, continue. We had to file, we filed both of them, as, as Eric uh, explained at the beginning. Uh, and, uh, initially, we, they were going to develop the other, the other lot. That's why we filed both of them. Things uh, changed and uh, they moved on. However, just to clarify the issue uh, with the, the lots. Number one, as you can see for yourself, uh, uh, Madam Chair can see for yourself on, on, on the uh, DOB or anywhere else that uh, these lots are two separate lots. They have two separate bin numbers and so on and so forth. So uh, these lots have nothing, that, they have nothing in common besides that they were owned by one individual. That's um, a definition for a zoning lot. And then you filed So this was recorded, right, in Akris. So that's a sec essentially a state. So if a title company was to do, and the title company is the one that gives, does the search to determine what's a zoning lot. If the title company goes online and finds that recorded against a property is a zoning lot description and ownership statement or a certification of parties and interests, it it determines that those two lots equals one zoning lot, and the only way, so for, for our bet, our purposes, this is one zoning lot, and when the board looks at applications, we look at the relationship in terms of whether the site can, whether, let's say, um, whether the waivers are needed, right? So understanding potentially ed educational deference and all of that stuff, it doesn't, um, obviate the need to look at the size of the zoning lot and what can be done on the zoning lot because you're asking for all of these waivers, right? And so we see a zoning lot, here it is, recorded, um, that's 44 inches, 44 feet wide by 100 and whatever that is, right? So, um, so therefore, you have a much nicer site, um, which, by the way, would make a better building. I mean, you have 44 foot wide floor plates. Arguably, right? Ma Madam Chair, I would like to, I would like to first explain exactly what the exhibit one and three is. The exhibit, whenever anybody in the entire city decides to do any sort of addition to his house, building, etc., he has to file exhibit one and three for sure. There's other exhibits depending on the ownership, but exhibit one and three has to be filed so that the building department could then go ahead and verify whether he or she has sold his or her rights. Uh, air right or so on to an adjacent property. By seeing this, this gives a, a legal description of the property and it lists all the owners involved. 
and if he or she would have sold uh, his ear, his or her ear, ear rights in the property, it would have listed that. And that's why the billing department requires that to be recorded. And then once it's recorded, we submit that we submit that to the Department of Buildings. Um, now, since they just were, with with all due respect to this. Sure. Um, exhibit three, known as the zoning lot description and ownership statement, it says an applicant for present or future permits pursuant to the zoning resolution of the city of New York and as subsequently amended states that the zoning lot to which the aforementioned permit or permits pertain are shown on the tax map of the city of New York and et cetera, et cetera. And then there's a meets and bounds description and then there's a diagram. So you, so the, and then it is, um, signed by the owner, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And this is actually prepared by a title company, mm -hmm. right? right? And so the title company prepares this to state what the size of the zoning lot is, exactly. and the owner signs it, therefore agrees. Exactly. So as of the date, which is today's date, because it hasn't been subdivided, this is one zoning lot. And the, the, re, the buildings department does it for a lot of different reasons, not just to find out whether air rights have been transferred. It does it because it needs to know what's the size of the zoning lot mm -hmm. against which you measure floor area, you measure lot coverage, you measure all kinds of things, mm -hmm. right? So, um, and um, sometimes once the zoning lot is merged, it can't be unmerged because to do so would create a, a new non-compliance. It can't be subdivided. Sure. So I don't know whether these lots are now um, substandard. Maybe they are because now this new lot can't really be developed. The, the, the corner lot can't be developed without variances. So it would create new non-compliances because these little houses are no longer complying houses. So you actually can never subdivide this zoning lot. Um, you're stuck. You made that decision, and now you have to live with it. Madam Chair, we're, 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 uh, I'm not exactly sure where you get uh, that information. Um, um, a lot of years of practice. The, <laughs> <laughs> um, the title company, which we used at that time, Ridge, Ridge Abstract, well, we used them at that time. They were lazy. They put in a, 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 a survey. They just they used to put in a survey of the property instead of drawing up. They uh, building department. Several, uh, I attend. I also attend plan examinations of Department of Buildings. When I attend plan examinations of Department of Buildings, many examiners took me uh, on on and said, "Hey, this is not this is not a sufficient uh, zoning lot description." They wanted me to, to draw it up instead of just plopping on a a survey. Now, since again, as we mentioned at the beginning, that these lots happen to be owned by one individual, so then the surveyor did one survey for both, and then when we sent the survey for, to the to Ridge Abstract to do their uh, sketch, instead of doing the sketch, they plopped on one one uh, survey on both, which looks extreme, uh, exactly alike. However, if you take a look at the previous page, the description. Yeah, it's, it was, a, like you said, a sloppy job putting the entire survey on it, but you've got two zoning lots. Dis the, um, at the description, descriptions, each one is for a 20-foot lot. Yeah. You'll yeah. see for yourself that they're individually, they're, they, each one has an individual lot number, and in order to combine the lots, we have to file uh, for a lot reapportionment with the Department of Finance and then get it approved by the Department of Buildings, which is a whole big process, which totally unintended at this point. So you're saying there's two separate zoning lot descriptions in ownership statement? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 133 and... One is for lot 166 and one is for lot 165. I don't... And this was recorded together. Because the original intent was to develop both of these sites. Is that why you have to submit it like this? They're two yeah. separate documents. They, they were, they, they, oh, they no, were not, they no, were not no, no, no. I thought they were filed at the same time. Two oh, separate, separate documents. Oh, they're two separate oh, okay. um, I didn't registers. Okay. okay. They each have their own CFRN okay. okay. numbers. Okay. They're, they're totally individual. Totally individual. Okay. All right. Okay. 
So, hmm. but we still have this issue of ownership in common, right? Which is one of our standards. So even if it wasn't yes, treated but as one zoning law. It's, we've been speaking about this recently, that there has to be an affirmative action taken to treat them as one zoning law. That's no. just simple common ownership alone no, no, no. is not that, enough. That's the Department of Building's way of determining whether a zoning law has been formed. That's not what we talk about. We talk about whether or not there's common ownership that would um, minimize the need for a variance because if you have common ownership then the lot becomes bigger and I, it's the option of the owner not to develop it that way as opposed to a requirement um, and there so that the variance shouldn't be driven by the owner's simple desire not to develop the other lot but by the, the facts of the case in other words they don't own the other one they can't own the other one because it's owned by somebody else right so that that's the problem. So so I'm not I, I think we're still in the same place, frankly, where because we see it's owned by the same entity I'm who's going sort to sort of back if we just back up, I'm I'm losing the fact that I've never seen just because a person owns two properties next to each other and they're independent operated independently of each other and there's been no affirmative action to merge them together, why that would why they'd be penalized and not being given the chance to apply for the variance. That's you know, it's, usually we have, when we have narrow lots, existing narrow lots, when you do a uniqueness study, you're distinguishing yourself from other narrow lots that right. might be owned in conjunction with a neighboring lot because the possibility exists that you can develop them both together. So that's usually one of the criteria for determining whether or not if it's, fe lot. if it's feasible to do so. Right, but it's, it's about the possibility that at some point they could be developed together. So usually what we do require is that you do an analysis of both lots and show whether or not that really is still keeping the uniqueness. Right, and you've, you know this because oh. you've done one on a very interesting Yeah, but here the, the uniqueness lots, is right? different because the uniqueness is not a true uniqueness finding here. The uniqueness is based upon the programmatic if, operations. Right, but that's only if you meet the findings of a school. Right. Then which, you get the educational Right, which is what we're making the application on. Well, we're making the don't, then right. you have Well, to we're making the application under on. that premise. That's our, that's our the theory of our case. Right, but so we, we didn't get to school yet, but I also do have a problem with the idea that you give a waiver where it's possible to develop this as a much better project and simply choosing not to. It's not as a matter of simply choosing not to, Madam well, Chair. With all due respect, not? it's not. It's because you're dealing with limited resources, with, with organizations that have multi, many different purposes in their, in their social and religious and educational missions. And just because they share a common denominator of, of two people, of one person having, uh, helping to create both of these different things, doesn't mean that their programs jive like that. One, they're two totally different operations. One is a shul where people daven and the people pray that they're proposing to do, where neighbors are going to walk in and come in off the street and, 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 and pray. The other is where children are going to be going. This information that I just passed out that, that's sitting next to Commissioner Shannon there, if you, could, if you want to take a look at, as well as this information all here, this is all stuff for children and students. This is not, has nothing to do with so this is the, kind of, the prayer part. This is kind of funny because we so... We just had an application this morning where, uh, early in the day, where a synagogue and a, and a nursery school and a, and a rabbinical course yes. are all being combined into one much building. Much different, much different. And I could take you, and we could all travel around the city and go to restaurants that serve 30 different kinds of food and say, why doesn't this restaurant do it? It's about the program. No, actually. It's, 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 no, it, it clearly, there's a reason why the, the, the councilman here is here. There's a reason why the state senator is here. We're, it's because this is, not, this is not a local synagogue that's trying to be like the one this morning on 76 Road that's trying to be for their local community where they're trying to service people. It's not like the mosque that it's going to have next where they're creating a, a center that's for their local <coughs> community. They're going to talk to you about it. This is something that's for the city of New York that's servicing an entire geographic region. Its program doesn't mix 
with just because everybody's a Jew or everybody has interest <laughs> in Jewish things is not the common denominator here not, with these. That's actually not what we're saying, but we've seen so many mixtures of functions in synagogues, in schools, and everything, and then the idea that I know you've you seen can't that. possibly make you a can't. design where you no. have one axis from one place and one another no, axis from another place. No, because it's the purpose. With a better building that the, takes up a better shape no, of the lot, No, you can't. Et you can't, because the purpose of this is to create. Yes, I have a uh, question. you don't have to raise your hand. So, just talk whenever you want. Um, sure. uh, I have a question, <laughs> and, and that is, even though the ownership of these two tax lots are same, uh, the the catchment area, the the catchment for both of these are completely different. There might be a neck. There might be some overlap, but you're saying they're totally different. This is the entire city of New and, York, and, and even the, the state. And the funding, and the funding. The fun, everything is totally different. Everything is completely different. The only common denominator is there's people that sit on the board of directors of both of them. And originally, oh, yeah. I'd imagine one benefactor had the houses and said, you know what? Mm -hmm. Here, you guys take them and do what you want to do with them. If it, if it, I mean, if it would, I'm hearing and you talk, and I'm thinking to myself, maybe the way we make the case is we transfer out one of the properties and sell it, transfer it to another organization. So that way we have two different organizations. But it seems like sort of a, a lot of work to do to get back to the same point. We're not here, I started off, nobody's here telling you that we're trying to, we're not trying to get a variance to shortcut anything or to create something for the typical reasons that people come before you. What we're trying to create is something that, so that when the university comes with their students, they walk into a building that's wholly dedicated to the educational process that they're creating here. That doesn't have strangers walking in that are there to daven, that doesn't have people coming in off the streets that are there for, for mentoring with a rabbi or some kind of service with a rabbi, that, that nobody's coming in for Shabbat services or, or, or nobody's coming in because of the death of a loved one, but rather that everybody is there for the sole purpose of everything that you're seeing in front of you. Maybe. You can I can't explain it. But maybe okay. Ruth. Why don't, you know what's really hard for me about this is being an architect and looking at a floor plate that's 44 feet wide versus and not using plate. it. It's killing you. I no, know. it's. I don't see how because a 22 foot wide lot is restricted by so much vertical circulation that it's a really, really inefficient project. I and obviously. If, you no, can, let me just finish. And if the architect is the architect. Yeah, here? Louis Garfinkel's okay, right here. Right. So if Mr. Garfinkel were to actually do drawings to show how with a 44 by 100, whatever the step site is, a project where you combine these two uses where you have separate entrances, it won't be any different at all from what would happen if the synagogue were developed next door because that's just right next door. There's a door right there. But we still have the same yard issues. We're still going to be... Let her finish. Oh, yes, sorry. please yeah. let me finish. I thought we were so, but what you've got is an extraordinarily great floor plate for both the synagogue on some level, and on one of the levels, and for the archival rooms, the libraries, the lecture hall. It's an infinitely better project than crowding a 22 foot a crowding Question, a 22 please. foot wide building with elevators two staircases all of that sort of stuff where there's hardly any room left to do anything so and you could combine the egress requirements and so on, so you don't have to have as many staircases. But well, let me ask you so a question. So it would be such a better project. But how would we get around the 10-foot front yard requirements? I'm not saying that you can't that you can do it necessarily without a variance. That's not what I'm talking about. But by the way, this whole educational deference thing, which has been quite tricky for us here then this would help you because now you have religious deference for the synagogue. I know, but it doesn't help. It's not our program. Well, but that's you're dealing with very intelligent. You're dealing with like people who expand your mind and talk and let they them try and thought, understand what the how the interface with drawings would work. That's the part that I'm having. The client so is more intelligent than my than in her no, pinky than my entire your body. Client is an architect, so, right? Your client's not an architect, and the whole point about architecture is it can often. I mean, that's what architects do. They show the client what the client tells them they want to see, and then they say, you know, we could do it like this. We can just, like, move a couple of Ruth, walls and this, Ruth. like, let me just finish. Yeah, sure. And we can just move a couple of walls, and we can build this kind of thing. But look what happens when I tear down all the walls, and I open this up, and I provide all those things. Isn't that?
that a better solution? And that's the architect's job. She knows. Actually. They know that. They've spoken about this. They know they own that. They have. They all sit on the same board of directors. It's the oh. same people. They've owned the property for years. Everybody's thought this has been thought out and thought out and thought out on so many different levels so with so many I different like people. I would like to see why it doesn't work. Uh, why don't we have Ruth? If Ruth is sitting here patiently, and I think she's going to explain a little bit too because she's explain, she's been the one involved. Good evening. Thank you. State your name, please. Eric. My name is Ruth Lichtenstein. And I am representing Project Witness. Thank you. First, me, first let, allow me to explain who I am. So, on spring 2016, Project Witness was honored by the U.S. Senate. Let me share with you some of the thoughts that I shared then with the honorable senators and congressmen. Who am I? I'm a proud child of two Holocaust survivors. My father never shared with me how his son and his first wife were murdered, but what he could give no voice to found its way into books. He wrote over 30 books about the history of Poland. My burning interest in the Holocaust was ignited by my mother's stories about her childhood and about her experience in the Holocaust and about my father telling silence which spoke volumes. And out of his paint silence, I learned to remember. We cannot correct these wrongs, wrote my father, but we can and must recount the stories and history of these victims for those who will come after us, so their memories do not disappear into the abyss of the forgotten. Why are we here? Because Project Witness, the Holocaust Education Resource Center, is trying to give an answer to my father's words. As decades have passed since my father wrote these fateful words, and little has changed. The last generation of survivors, of Holocaust survivors, are leaving us. There is no doubt about the rise of anti-Semitism today, which makes its ugly imprint in a variety of political and social arenas. Here in the United States, from coast to coast, and not only in Europe, as we would like to think. Let's remember when the Holocaust Museum in Washington was established, was built by federal government, the question came up, why? And the answer was, because there is a universal message here. Let's remember, life goes on. Yet our obligation to remember to battle historical amnesia, to insist on remembrance and understanding as only different. And that's why Project Witness was established, to be the voice of the mothers who lost their children, of the girls who never became mothers, the youth who lost their future, the grandparents who never saw their grandchildren growing, for the intellectuals, the workers, the housewives, the store owners and to the children to impart the message to future generation so that my dear brother Mendele and million and a half children like him will never be forgotten. Mendele was murdered just four months before liberation with his mother. My father remarried and I am the youngest one, or as people like to joke, the only son. Um, Project Witness, as since its establishment, uh, prepared and worked on uh, a very serious selection of programs from junior high through college, from for yeshiva students, to public schools and in between. I brought here with me 
different, you know, samples of different programs where you can see and understand why it's not only that Martin Luther had a dream, but I have a dream. And my dream is to bring together the future generations that is coming from different neighborhoods, from different boroughs of the city, from different ages. The center is going to have cutting edge technology. And so a lot could go into, I don't have to tell you what we have today. But when you check the programs, and I am ready to explain the programs, when you check them, you can see very clearly that it needs its place. It doesn't have to be a big place. Let's remember, Project Witness is a totally 501c. What shall I tell you? My husband is not here. He has a good line. He says, some people are taking Holocaust, making money out of it. My wife takes money and making Holocaust. Um, bottom line, and I'm ready to answer you know, all your questions about our programs. Okay. We established something. We established some things that with, with the years, we did not even dream how far we are going to get. Uh, we started with public schools, we developed programs, we have been in touch with the Board of Ed, we were asked to add programs. We started with our first program in a public school in Harlem. I have here with me the testimony, he could not come, of the principal and the person in charge of social studies. Uh, I have here um, different materials that can prove to you times and again, we need our place. We do not have the money. Whatever you see here, it's all on my shoulders to get what we get. So we don't go, you know, all the way in unrealistic ways that we will not be able to build it. I really hope that the day when children from yeshivas will come and children from public school will come, and I promise to invite all of you to come and to see it and to learn that yes, only through education we can build a future in this city. Thank you. Okay, don't go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So we, we really do need to understand better about the program. So yes. just to just to, for you to understand what we need is that um, because we're not sure that this is a unique site, which is a finding for a variance, we need to determine that it is a, a, a program that is related to education, right? And when we say education, it's not like the general um, kind of education of the public so that they sort of learn good things. It's got to be something that's affiliated with a degree granting institution or a school. So um, a school as in, um, as in a New York State regulated school, right? So um, I'm going to use an example of a case that I always use as the, one of the best cases for this, where uh, we had a project that's called um, uh, Settlement, um, House. Settlement House. Um, Settlement House is a not-for-profit community center in Brooklyn. And um, so under sort of the basic thinking, the services that they provide, which are like gym services, and they teach computers, and they teach a lot of other, lots of different kinds of things. Um, what made them educational in, in character was that the local public schools depended very much on the programs that Settlement House offered um, to meet the school's educational requirements. So the school sent kids to use the gym there. They sent kids there to learn computers and chess and lot, math and math skills, a lot of different things, right? So, and they were able to show us very specifically um, relationships that they had with public schools to um, provide that kind of program, right? So we need you to help us understand how, um, what you do, and I, and I do see, that's the reason we wanted you to submit us copies of the textbooks, because we only saw like a little 
sort of instructional pamphlet. Um, we, we need you to help us understand how your work um, on site specifically, as opposed to off site, will, uh, because you're creating a site that has spaces, will be used with schools to, as part of their degree granting programs, either diploma or degree granting programs. Okay? Uh, can I answer? Yes. Yeah. Can I just say one thing? Yes, of course. Okay, I'm sorry. Jessica Rubenstein on behalf of Eric Palatnik, PC. Um, as the board is aware, in our statement of facts, we relied on the Louis Armstrong case um, to argue that um, Project Witness in a similar manner is a youth group three school um, because of their connection and association with the new seminary and Adelphi University. So who we have here is the dean from the new seminary who will explain the link that we tried to rely on to show that students taking Project Witness courses at the new seminary actually receive college credit from Adelphi University. And so that's why, and we relied on that case. Yeah. You're looking at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> no, because we talked about Louis Armstrong. That's part of Queens College. It's actually, they own the building. Okay. And they um, include, when you go on the Queens College website, the Louis Armstrong music program is something you just click on their menu, right? And so it's clearly integral to the Queens College program to get a degree in musicology. So it's really very different than... Um, so that's why I use the settlement house comparison. We have another one where um, it's the Alvin Ailey School, mm -hmm. where Alvin Ailey Dance, Dance Program, which is, it has a degree granting program from Fordham University, where the students get a degree in performing arts and take required courses at the Alvin Ailey School. So I don't think Arms, Louis Armstrong is getting you there because of the ownership relationship. Um, and it's really very integral to the Queens College program, right? Okay. And the new seminary, as you heard from my comments, I have a lot of questions about what's new seminary. And we'll okay. get there, and just so the board okay. understands, so we'd be happy to switch which case we cite as precedent. Right. The board feels that that case is more appropriate. So, But she has, uh, this is Sarah Bulk and the dean of the new seminary, seminary. She has been waiting all day, so I would like her to speak about the program and how students receive college credit towards a bachelor's of art administration uh, from Adelphi University through their course. State your name again, please. The name is Sara Bolka. I'm the founder and dean of the new seminary. And um, Adelphi University has been mentioned here. I just want to mention that we are now in our 20th year of affiliation with Adelphi University. They are not our only university partner. We partner also with LIU, and we are now partnering with another university in New Jersey called Georgian Court University. All of these universities with which we partner recognize the courses, the various courses that we do, but they all recognize the course in history, the history of the Holocaust that we do in partnership with Project Witness and do give college credit, they award college credit for the course that we are doing. It is a unique course. I'll be happy to explain to you the concept of the seminary, yes, if please. that would be helpful. Yeah, start off with what are you? <laughs> <laughs> what am I personally? New, new, seminary. new seminary. What is okay. new seminary? Yeah. The seminary? The seminary started out with the concept that we needed to have proper teacher training because one of the essential the essential things we have is education. I'm very dedicated to it. I'm not going to tell you how many decades I've been doing it, but it's been a while. And the fact is that teachers need training, and I felt very strongly that within our community, the teachers needed much better formal training if we were going to have the kind, uh, the kind of educational structure that we need within the community for the benefit of the current generation, the next generation, etc. cetera. After having started the seminary, with a full complement of courses, I then also realized that it's not sufficient for them to... Sorry, you yes. have to go back. To where? Right? To, so who attends the seminary? Oh, okay. Where is the seminary located? Okay, the um, seminary is actually located. We have three sites. Uh, we don't own them. We lease in each of the sites. 
We have, uh, we are located, our main site is in Brooklyn on East 12th Street at 1492 East 12th Street. And that build, the building where we are, when they were building the building, we were their first tenant actually, we anchored the development. I know that initially they thought they were gonna do medical offices, which never happened. We took the first floor and the basement floor in which we created classroom space, office space, et cetera, that we needed for, the per for our purposes. So the certificate of occupancy of that site shows it as medical offices? I have no clue. Yeah, and I have no clue, we're just, we just offices. rent. What? So how many square feet is it? Oh, um, you want me? <laughs> No, I mean, I, you know what? I didn't bring those facts. I'll be happy okay. to get them for you. It's not a problem. So we re I really do need to understand this because okay. I went to your website trying to understand what new we didn't. Is. I don't think we discussed the physical plant on the website. Yeah, actually, well, yeah, it. it, it we it gave the addresses. Site, the addresses, and when I go there and I go to Google and I see that the building is a condominium. I in, I invite you to come and see. Okay, so okay. we. Definitely need more information. Okay, so I'll about explain that. it to you. Because then the other confusing one in particular is the Monsey Way. The Monsey one, which is on Mariner yes. Way. Right. Okay, so in Monsey we have a small satellite program, and there we are actually located within a synagogue, what they call in Brooklyn, they call it a Stiebel, and we have the use of that building during the week. We are only there. I'm getting a lot yeah, of echo. Yeah. Right. Maybe pull it, step back a little bit from that. Yeah. Will that help? Okay. Yeah. That's okay. We're only there. <laughs> that didn't help at all. Sorry. Just one second. I think it's my. Really? Way better. Try. Okay. Um, Muncie is our smallest satellite in Lakewood. Oh, so wait a second. So Muncie is a house. Well, it's a house which also houses a shul. It's a small shul, as you, if I could take you on a tour of Brooklyn also, even though I don't live here, uh, where there are many places of worship which happen within a house. That's the structure. Part of the, of the house over there, I don't know the whole place, part of it is a shul where they meet for prayers in the evenings, I think, primarily, and, on, and for the Sabbath. But during the rest of the time, the building is not used, and so we have access to that building for the small satellite uh, location for the students in Muncie who join our program. Most of our students attend in Brooklyn. We also have in Lakewood, New Jersey, we have another 30 or so students that attend over there where we also leased some space in a commercial building which we renovated to meet the needs, our needs, and of course the needs of the university, which means that our classrooms are equipped with smart boards and all the other equipment that the university needs so that these students can have the full benefit of the instruction. Professors actually come to us. Part of what happens is that the universities, each of the universities with which we partner, uh, they recognize our courses as meeting their criteria uh, which means that every single one of our courses which has been recognized was, refu was reviewed by a PhD member of the faculty of that university, as Adelphi University did 20 years ago when we first created this partnership. And they also are very, very careful that the credentials of whoever teaches the actual course under the auspices of the university or directly by the seminary all hold at least a master's degree or higher in order for these courses to qualify for college credit. So, still confused about the fact that you have a house that's a very nice house and the neighbors would probably really be unhappy. They're not at all unhappy. No, they're all aware. Activity no, they're all enough. very well aware. It's, it's very, it, it, it is uh, called, it's a, whatever, it's a horseshoe, that street. Mm -hmm. There is no secret about the fact that we're there. It is a small group. If we grow more over What's there, small, small group? we go up to 10 people there. That's it. So there are 10 students Maybe, uh, depending on the year. Okay, and 30 students on in Lakewood. Ocean Avenue. In, no, in Lakewood. In Lake, that's Lakewood. In Lakewood. Right. And, in, and in Ocean Avenue, we will have anywhere from 80 to 100. Wait, no, Ocean Avenue, 139 uh, no, Ocean Not Ocean Avenue, Avenue. no, 139 Ocean, now I'm getting confused. Yeah. 139 Ocean Avenue is in Lakewood. Right. All right. Sure. And in Brooklyn on East 12th Street, 
We can have anywhere from 80 to 100. We can accommodate about 100 students for all the spaces that we have. We essentially have three classroom areas. We have two large classrooms, which can also be opened up into a large lecture hall. And we have a, a third classroom, which seats maybe up to about 25 people as well. In addition to which, we have a student lounge, uh, you know, with computers and everything for the students. We have offices there and counseling uh, area, in other words, academic counseling, which is provided to the students over there. That's, that's the facility in Brooklyn. In, uh, in Lakewood, we have something similar, but over there we have two classrooms. We don't have three classrooms. So also on your website, it says, and I'm just quoting your website. Go right I'm ahead. not making anything up here. Mm -hmm. It says, do it quick, do it right. Um, <laughs> Benefit from our individualized guidance and hadracha. Enjoy a year uh, and earn credits while pers a year. Okay, so let um, me explain that to you. Yes. I'll go through it with you. I can understand your confusion. And when people come to get interviewed, I pull out all the, the sheets, the, the entire program of study. And I say, I want to take away the mystery. I want you to understand exactly what is being done here. And basically, what's happened with each of the universities is that since the universities recognize our studies for credit, what they do is they do with us what they call dual enrollment. Now, the students who come to us are students who are used to having attended a dual program from the time they started school. They attend a full, a full complement of Judaic studies, Hebrew studies, and a full complement of general studies. And they do this throughout their schooling. So they attend school from the morning until early evening, taking both full programs as, from the day they start school. So when they get into the college, they're used to that. They're used to the idea of doing a dual program. So the university, I already explained to you that the, each of the universities that partner with us accept our courses. They have each created an entire list which they reviewed of each course to say, this course is equivalent to that. For instance, we do a course called uh, principles of education, it's considered to be the equivalent of the Foundations of Education course. These types of classes, every single class has been literally carefully reviewed by the university in terms of all of the different aspects of it. And all of this is face-to-face -face instruction, right? This is all face-to-face -face instruction. It's not credit by exam. It's not, you know, it's not distance learning. This is face-to-face -face instruction. But the students are attending two schools at the same time. So what happens is if a, if a student were to come to a college today and say, okay, I want to earn my degree, the standard way of earning a degree would be to do, uh, to do two semesters for four years, right, which adds up to eight semesters. Fall and spring, fall and spring, you can accelerate by doing summers if you want, but the standard is fall and spring, fall and spring over a four-year period and you earned your degree. Well, the students who come to us are getting from the university, let's say, I'm just going to use Adelphi because we're speaking about in New York. So Adelphi University uh, has classes for them for fall and spring, and yes, their professors come to our site, as well as for certain classes, our students go to the campus. For instance, sciences, they take on the campus, where they are provided the science to the cohort. The cohort comes there as a group, and they, are, they have classes that are scheduled for them as a cohort. As I say, we don't build multi-million dollar labs. We didn't buy a building. I guess I didn't figure out that there's a money-making opportunity here, but we basically are providing them the access to everything the university has to offer. Every single semester, Jane, who comes to our program, is taking classes with the seminary, and then in the afternoons and evenings, the professors are coming and giving classes as well. So every semester, we send a transcript to the university which says, Jane Smith took the following classes in the fall, and here are the grades that she earned. And these are then given to the university, which then will post these onto her transcript as part of an umbrella called prior learning. Now, if our students were older, they could come along and argue that they have life experience. If, for instance, if I came to the college now and I didn't have my degrees, and I'd say, I want to come to school, I'd say, but I've done a lot of stuff. And they'd say, OK, let's take a look at it and evaluate your life experience, which is a standard practice of most major universities today. 
because our students tend to be younger, so most of them don't qualify for that life experience aspect, but the life experience is called prior learning. And since the university reviews our courses and says this is the equivalent of that, they are giving them credit under that category of prior learning. Now, in the degree, they must earn a minimum of half the credits must be from a, clearly from the college. In other words, they can't earn all those credits through us. They, can, they have to earn out of 120 credits, at least 60 minimum must come from college. The other credits can be a combination. So over the course of the year, our students are attending the seminary, and we go also through the year, and they'll have a fall, a winter, a spring, summer one and summer two, which gives them five terms with the seminary, four semesters with the university, which is fall, spring, summer one, and summer two. And this gives them nine semesters of study. Now the college, to complete a degree, the norm is eight semesters of study. They've got nine, and in addition to which, most of our students, not all, but most of our students, are coming in having earned some college credits earlier through programs that they have within the high schools that give them access to college credits in their senior year. So students are coming in anywhere from 12 to 24 credits, depending on where they're coming from, when they come in. Those are college credits. They're taking the credits they take with us. They also take a language exam through NYU and that comes under prior learning, and the rest of the credits are all straightforward college uh, credits. The university does allow, and, but most of the students don't actually do this, a maximum of 12 credits in CLEP tests, which is the college level examination program which is done through the college board. That would be the maximum that they could bring in that way. So every student coming into the program is earning a minimum of 48 straightforward college credits taught by the university, Maybe some of them are getting 12 credits through CLEPS or other, other way, and the rest of it they can have in whatever combination, but it's all face-to-face -face instruction, and it's a high level of instruction. And the reason I can say it is because the success of our students, having gone on to all the graduate schools, whether it's Columbia or NYU or Rutgers or any top-notch university you want to mention, our students have been very well represented, and not only did they get in, but they excelled when they got there, which meant that they didn't just earn get a piece of paper, they really got an education. And that's what we really pride ourselves on. So what's the one year? So the one year is possible. Remember, I said they can be duly enrolled, right? Yeah. So I have somebody comes in, and she's starting in August, which is when the fall semester starts. So in August of 2017, she started her program. Her fall semester ends in December, right? So then she has Adelphi University again from January through May. That gives her her spring semester. Then she has the summer sessions. Um, Adelphi has two summer sessions. She takes classes in both. That gives her four semesters with Adelphi University over the course of that year. She is also simultaneously enrolled in the seminary. That's our dual enrollment, where she's earning additional credits with us during that time. Now, so I saw... I, credits is that? They can earn everything, but most of the students, as I said, are coming in with credits. Look, if anyone for whom this is difficult, they don't finish in a year. They'll go later. No, wait, wait, wait. You need to take 120 credits in order to get Well, the Delphi University credits that they're doing, because it's the adult program, it's university college, or they changed it to the College of Professional and Continuing Studies is what it's called right now. And yes, we have to update our site to put that in because they, they made a change in their logo and this, right? Um, they, their courses that they're taking with the Delphi University are four credit courses. So if a student is taking four classes, let's say in the fall semester, she could be earning 16 credits, okay? And if she does that for four semesters, she can earn 48 credits directly through the instruction of Adelphi University over that period of time, correct? All right. With the seminary, our classes are three credit classes. And with the seminary, technically, she could earn, if she can do 15 credits in the fall, and 15 On, on top of the 14 credits? Yeah, of the four classes. Yes. Oh, so let me, go, you know what, I'm going to go back a second. No, 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 no. This is 16 minutes already. Hello? Please? I'm sorry, you're not conducting the hearing. We okay. Are, so. All right. Let, let me explain something to you, okay? <laughs> When I first, I'll share, I'll, okay. 
I'll share something with you. When I first had my big meeting with Adolphi University, I'd met with different people, and they called me down to a meeting. The meeting took place in a room a little bit bigger than this. I had no idea that I was walking into a room that was going to be filled with representatives of every single department at the university, the president's office, the provost's office, et cetera, et cetera. And I presented this idea to them, and I said to them, look, our students are used to doing a dual program all the time. And I said, how much does it take for your students to be considered to be full-time? I wouldn't have asked the question. As lawyers know, you don't ask a question if you don't know the answer. And of course, the answer was 12 credits. I said, well, 12 credits represents 12 hours of class time during the week. I'm, doesn't, I'm not talking about the additional work. That's what 12 credits is. I said, that's your full-time student. I said, what are they doing the rest of their time? So they looked at me. And I said, they party. My students don't party. It's not what they do. They're here to be fully focused on their studies. Of course, it took them 10 years to figure out how come these girls who don't party are getting married in the meanwhile, right. and they're continuing on, building families. So they're taking 32 credits a semester, is what you're saying? Essentially. Well, Sorry, I've gone to a lot of schools. It's not a physical possibility. <laughs> uh, Without any partying, I didn't do okay. any of that. Okay. Uh, all right. You know what? Our students are not working okay. while they're going to school. Right. Okay. They're not working so, while they're going to school. Okay. So we really need, because it's very hard for us to believe this, um, to uh, get some more information on some written information, because the only thing I could find out was from the what website do you, what do you, what do you about how, how your program works. Um, so whatever kind of materials you have, whatever kind of... You want of our brochures? Uh, or something that's more detailed you want that you would be giving students so that they can actually understand. Because I actually went onto a chat room where the students are complaining that they can't find anything out about the new seminary well, themselves. So yes, they can, I don't know. I'm, right. I am, thank God, inundated with calls and interviews. Can I? Okay. So I, they're finding out and they're signing do you up. Have, do you have any uh, uh, agreement with? Yes, of course. Uh, uh, of, course. of course. And, and of course. And of course. Can you please also provide that? Yes. No, that no, that no. That's that's a uh, that's confidential information of our contract. But I can get you letters from the universities attesting okay. to our to our affiliation, but in terms of the, well, you know, that I'm not going to share. We're under trying to understand that they grant degrees. They do. With classes, based on classes that are taught by your program and in Rosario. And theirs. And theirs, of course. I mean, let's but not so minimize that. Explain, explain how in the world this works, yeah. that they recognize that a student actually can take 32 credits in a semester because that frankly, is very hard for me to understand. Um, oh, well, and then, and actually does the work, as opposed to students that I knew. Uh, well, our, st work. our students have done this throughout their schooling. They've right. always attended two schools at the same time because they've done Judaic studies and they've done general studies, right. the, full, the full load, and they have always done it and have done it successfully. Okay. All right? right? Okay, and then the... Um, so we really, really, and then in particular, because we're really talking about Project Witness. Um, so you want to understand that part. We want to understand sure. how the programs that are taught by or provided by or how it works with Project in Witness folds into a degree granting okay. program at Adel Adelphi or NYU or whichever one. All right. Use. So the Project Sorry. Witness course. Yes, yeah, yeah, it would be. No, since we're, yeah. you don't have to do this right now. We're yeah, okay. we want to see. Yeah, but we also and we want to see. We need to see this in writing because it's that the then, class is given that you get credit for the class. We we need to understand that Adelphi and or NYU or whichever no. degree grant. No, not at NYU. Okay. About. Adelphi, LIU, Georgian I'm sorry, Court. LIU. Mm -hmm. um, that they recognize your course yes. of study. Not a problem. That the degree granting program understands that this is a 32 credit per semester mechanism. That the and that specifically the classes that are taught through the project witness program or however this is working um, are accepted by that institution for credit that goes towards the degree that's granted by Adelphi. Because one of my problems with this is. You know, another student goes to Adelphi and spends four years there, and I interviewed two students. Both have Adelphi degrees. One managed to get a degree in a year, 
and the other one got a degree in four years. And th they look the same because they're holding the same diploma, presumably. And that gives me pause, right? Well, um, they actually, if you go on Adelphi's website, there's a State of the Union address that they put on their website that talks about their partnership with New Seminary. And that they Is that they from granted, President Scott? Was that from President Scott? Uh, 2011, yes. State of the University, final Yes, says, uh, the president part, called me in and they gave me an award. Seminary with whom we have arranged access to programs for students who have special needs and special commitments to their orthodox community. Since 1998, 444 students who have enrolled through this partnership have graduated from Adelphi. Okay. So they actually do they talk about them. that. Okay. And then it says this past year, 113 new seminary students were studying in university college and another 41 were in the School of Nursing. Okay. So, and my other problem is there's another institution called New Seminary. So I need to make sure that we're talking about your. There is something on the web. On the web, yeah. I know that's New Seminary, which is a Christian exactly. organization. So that's confusing. I am not familiar with them. Okay. I have had calls so, from them when they got to our website and asked some questions, and I said, I think you went to the wrong one. Our website is called the New Seminary. That, okay. will, that so, makes a big difference. So, but of course, we need clarification because one. So, what do you need clarification outside, about? You just so, got this. So that no. Thank you. So that because it's Adelphi is going to be giving a letter to you. And, no problem. And, okay. No just problem. To understand. All right. All of this by way of having us understand that there's an educational component to what Project Witness does. That's right. recognized by degree granting institutions. Correct. Okay. Thank right. you. Thank you. you need anything else for me? No, I think so. <laughs> okay. Just one quick fun fact about not believing everything on someone's website. Eric Platnick PC does not have a website, and we exist. And a good reason. Just saying. <laughs> we exist. <laughs> no, we're real good, in the flesh. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good connection. <laughs> um, okay, so. Yes, we yes. have. Yeah, go ahead. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, good evening, Commissioners. On behalf of Councilman Greenfield, I'll read a short letter. And, I, you, and say your name. Daniel Perlstein. I write today in wholehearted support of the application of Project Witness. I'm extremely proud of the work Project Witness does throughout the city from its base in Borough Park, which I'm privileged to represent in the Council. Holocaust education is extremely important in today's world. No group or school takes that mandate more seriously than Project Witness. From its work with descendants of Holocaust victims and survivors in Brooklyn, to its programs in public schools citywide, Project Witness each and every day does the critical work of teaching our children about the hideous genocide of the past to inform their citizenship for a more humane future. As this board well knows, our city, Brooklyn, and Borough Park are all rapidly developing and crowded communities. Whatever land remains developable faces very significant challenges. I commend Project Witness for its highly creative approach to utilizing its site at 4701 19th Avenue. Our community is home to tens of thousands of children and hundreds of schools about which you just learned one. A new school building dedicated to Holocaust education on a small corner lot will add so much to our educational, social, and cultural fabric without comp compromising excuse me, its residential character. And the councilman obviously wholeheartedly, uh, respectfully requests that you join him in the tremendously worthy application. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. OK, so we had some other questions that were specifically about the space. But, um, I, but I do need. Um, Ms. Lichtenstein, to um, respond very specifically to all the different affiliations with the schools, not all, but you know, a good half, a good chunk of affiliations with schools, mm -hmm. what they provide, and, and once there is a space, how the students, and you don't have to answer this here, because we really need it to be in writing, mm -hmm. um, and how, the stu how once the building is built, the students will actually be coming, because actually, there's conflicting information in the statement of facts versus the um, study. I think it's the parking study, mm -hmm. which uh, one the parking study says that it's going to be for basically for K through 12. Mm -hmm. The statement of facts and of course the whole new seminary indicates it's actually a university oriented program with occasional visits by school children who might come from New Jersey even. So something's. Not we'll update the right parking program, um, and uh, and for instance, how often would kids come or adults come? And because my understanding actually is that with a lot of these training materials, it would be better if 
the programs were taught at the schools because it's just easier, obviously, to not have to transport kids by bus and all of that sort of stuff. So, right, and which is how it was has been done. So, yeah. Okay. You can do this in writing. Yeah, you right? can do this in writing, if, but you can also... Okay, let me just say, I may, one thing. As of now, we are in a basement. We call it the bunker, which consists of a room and a half. Okay? We have no choice. We must go out to schools. We must go out, as I said before, from junior high all the way through high school, seminary. We have teachers training, which I'll be more than happy to share with you what we do. We work with top um, Holocaust institutions, if this is Shaw Foundation, if this is uh, USHMM in Washington, if this is Heritage Museum here, if this is uh, Yad Vashem in Israel, etc., etc., etc. We work with scholars, top Holocaust scholars and researchers. Um, now, we went out because we had no choice, because we don't have where to bring right. people in. Okay. Okay, so, so here's our problem. It's 7 o'clock. We're going to be kicked out of this building at 9 o'clock. Okay, so I am um, ready so, to give it all in writing. Yes, so please, no give it in, please give it in writing, but we, have to under, we need to understand the program better. Writing and, is out. Right, okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> so this should be easy for you. I hear the holes that need to be filled, yes. and we'll work on okay. filling and the then, record. With and then, the again, time. because we need to move this on um, along, we had, we had questions about the use of the spaces, so we need a clear um, use of the classrooms, an understanding of how the classrooms will be used and all of that, um, and uh, yeah. I understand. Right? Not just the classroom. Also, also the lecture hall. Yeah, because what we're seeing is um, you want to make sure the building no overlap, the program, right? Or, vice versa. Right? So we need to see that it establishes the need so that Understood. something. Understood. Understood. Okay. It. Okay. Do it quickly, yeah. I think uh, you also heard our comments uh, in the lesser variance. You went with the option of doing a cellar and a basement and the first floor. Um, we would like you to, uh, you know, I want to know why that was not considered for proposed. And I think that's a more realistic approach because you can use the entire lot line in the cellar to do a lot of the work. And then the basement you can uh, build up as much as you can and then set back where possible, and I think that can address the programmatic need and reduce the bulk. So look, please look into that and, and, and respond to that. The architect and, is nodding at you. Yeah. Right, and, the, and the, <laughs> the, the lesser variants and the proposed have different programmatic requirements, exactly. which doesn't make workshop. sense. Right. Right. Got it, we'll yeah. fix it up. Got it. Yeah. Okay, so rather than I understand. spend time, more time talking about it, I've heard our comments. It was very important to hear from the two yeah. educational groups, though, because we were extremely confused. Got um, so, and we need more information from them, and you heard the line of questions, yep. right? Okay. Understood. All right. Are there speakers from the public on this one? Yeah. Yes? Yes. Any speakers on this uh, 470119 Debbie Project Witness? Okay. No. All right. They're all here Good. for the next one. All right. So, um, that's a big one. You have a lot of fans. <laughs> okay, so could we do this February 13th? Is that it? I down. Yeah, I think that one is okay. Kind of empty? Just Bedford is all I see, right? No, there's also that uh, appeal. Yeah, the appeal. Oh, the appeal. Okay. Oh, yeah. there's just, there's not, a, not a lot. Okay. So as okay. is Bedford. Yeah, Bedford Avenue. Bedford Avenue. Okay. All right. So let's say February 13th. Okay. If, unless that's not enough time for you. That, that should be fine. Okay. One, two. So that would be uh, January 24 submission. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. I Thank really do appreciate appreciate your help understanding this. Um, and your help and your weight the, the patience. Thank you. We may do that. <laughs> we do site visits. We may need to understand better. <laughs> okay. Item number three, 2016.
1920, Amethyst. 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 Like hard to pronounce. Amethyst. It's hard. It's hard to. Pr it's like the stone, but it's hard. Yeah. Definitely. All right. I'll talk quick because I know Jesse Major and, and <laughs> the other people behind me, and they've got bigger mouths than me. But we're here from Muslim American Society. They've all waited all day long. Everybody's taking the entire day off of work. Guys, raise your hand if you're from, and women, that's the crew from Muslim American Society. So we have all gambits covered. We go from the Jews to the Muslims, but everybody's doing the same thing. <laughs> Everybody is doing the same thing. Everybody is creating these wonderful buildings that are such assets to the community that are going to outlast us. And now you've got the Muslim community here that, unlike the Jews, came later to America and are trying to build, well, later in great, no, great numbers. And are trying later history, in great numbers and are trying to build, <laughs> right? Careful. They're trying to build homes. And right? they have an area in the Bronx that they've dominated. And you look at the pictures, and I know that Commissioner Ollie Brown, you were there, unfortunately, at an off time. And they were all very upset that you didn't get to see hundreds of them in the street when you were there. <laughs> but they're in the street by the hundreds every single Friday. And their numbers are growing because more people are immigrating to the country. And I said that before they knew. What I meant was they view it as their role to not only teach religion, but teach the culture of their religion. And they believe also in share, <coughs> sharing the services that they create. So one of the very important, you, you see in this building, I know that the building is relatively simple. You're very familiar with it. It's a cellar and, and three floors. And you see that we have classrooms on two of the floors, on the first floor, on the cellar, excuse me, and the third floor. And, and the reason why, and the, the second floor, excuse me, the reason why we have all of these classrooms is because unlike the Jewish population that we just spoke about, where they have students that come maybe in the afternoon and learn about things. In the Muslim community, on the weekends, the children are committed to nothing but learning about their religion. And every day on Saturday, <coughs> Saturday and Sunday, the building is filled with children and families. Friday, I'm, I'm not that familiar with the Muslim religion, so I'm, I'm learning. Maybe, but maybe you should I'm, I'm, I'm learning a lot, but and what I've learned, I didn't know so much about it, but Fridays is the big day, and Friday is the day of prayer where you get hundreds of people coming. But the weekends, unlike what I've been exposed to, which is primarily Jewish and Catholic religion, which is Jews go on Friday night, Catholics go on Sunday morning, on the weekends in their religion, that's when the families come together to learn about the culture. So the building, I saw the questions yesterday, and we probably could have explained it a little bit better. Why are there so many classrooms, and why do you have two of these open spaces? I know we're used to seeing maybe in some other religions, you might see two open spaces, and somebody might be thinking maybe there's a catering hall going in. That's not the case with this group of people at all. As a matter of fact, if you ask them, I didn't even know this, I'm learning so much, they can't even have music in their facility. I never knew that. So forget about a caterer, what kind of party was there without music? And they like to party. They told me about their weddings are great. But unlike the students that were with the, 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 uh, the, the facility, uh, the new the, the friend seminary that don't party, they like it, but they don't do it in the building. So the reason why is because it's against their religion. So what you're seeing at the cellar level and at the third floor, at the cellar level, you're seeing a common room with, surrounded by classrooms. That's when the younger children are having classes on Saturdays and Sundays. They're not in class all day long. They come out. They have to eat. They hang out. They socialize. They talk to other people. That's what's going on in that common room down there every day, Saturday and Sunday. Upstairs. Upstairs where? On the third floor. <laughs> Third floor, right? Yeah. I'm on the right floor, right? You've got another uh, yeah. room. Third floor. third floor, you have a recreation room, right? I'm with you. Right, I should have said second, third floor. On uh, the third floor, where the recreation area is, is that's the area where they'll have not only, not devoted necessarily just to the students that are in school on Saturday and Sunday, but the other social programs they have. They'll have first of all, they'll have a lot of recreational activities up there. They'll have gym mats up there. They'll have foosball tables and ping pong tables and things like that. But they'll also use it for the counseling, for the counseling programs that they have on the weekends. While the children are in class, the adults are there having counseling sessions and they're meeting with the imam and they're meeting with other members of the congregation and they're going through the events of the week and they're going through all the different programs you have, the tutoring and the this and the that. And, and Mr. Uh, where's, uh, there you go. He's going to speak in a second, uh, yes. and Jamal is going to speak, and he's going to tell you a little bit more about it. But the uh, basic idea of what they're doing on that third floor 
is they're creating a space that could be utilized while the, the kids are in class on the lower floors so that the building becomes alive on the weekends. And that's what it's all about. It doesn't, this socialization aspect and the educational components that I'm talking about obviously don't happen in the prayer rooms. The prayer sanctuaries are separate and apart. They're not multi-purpose. It's ingrained in their religion. They are clean spaces. They're devoid of physical objects. And they're a holy space that's not to be interrupted with other uses. So there is no use of the women's sanctuary or the men's sanctuary. There's no non-simultaneous uses. Maybe we could have classes there when they're not praying. It's not in their religious culture. So that's why the building is set up the way it is. That's what the purpose of the classrooms are. Some of the classrooms are home economics classrooms uh, where they have things set up uh, for primarily for women, but not to teach them just how to take care of the home, but how to build a business and a life and how to earn a livelihood out of things related to the home. So question. Home. So, all those so on the second floor, there are these four classrooms, right? Yes. So why can't, and these are, Mostly these are general questions just about how this thing operates, right? Why can't whatever goes on in those four classrooms happen on the cellar level? Um, where there's all those classrooms. Why don't you come up, Jamil? And, yeah. And I'll introduce Jamil Yosef. Is, uh, he's uh, been the main person that, that's been our point of contact throughout the application process. He's been the, the de facto leader of this zoning portion of the application, mm -hmm. not, of, not of the mosque. Uh, but and he's going to explain to you exactly okay. why he set it up because he's the mastermind behind the design. Okay, the mastermind. Okay, please state your name and also tell us what your connection is. Uh, Jamil Youssef. Uh, I'm a professional uh, engineer in the state of New York, uh, member of the uh, project committee. And so you're uh, a member of the board, or I'm a member of the of the of the board. Yeah. Yes. Um, you know, I, I I've been sitting here since like 12 o'clock and um, <laughs> no, no no I'm not I'm not complaining <laughs> I, I learned so much and I learned that there's something unique about our case that's different than every other case that you heard today everybody came here today because they have something new because they want to do something that's like not not existing or expanding something in our case is a solution to a problem. We have an existing situation. We have an existing mosque that is very small, that is not sufficient to even a small percentage of our needs, and it's causing a number of problems with, the, uh, with, with our surroundings there and with the community and with traffic. And what we are proposing here is really a solution. It is a re relocation. We're not bringing something new to the area. It's a not a new, it's like a new development. We are relocating. We are going from small place to a bigger, larger place so that we can solve a number of problems which will be to our benefit and to the whole community. Um, I also liked um, the description that I heard today about uh, places of worship. I think uh, you put it uh, like you hit it right on the nail when you said that, you know, when you talked about the a first floor, which is like a grand open space, which is typical of all places of worship. And that, and, and, and a Muslim mosque is not different in that, in that way from a church or synagogue or, or any other place of worship. We need that grand, large space that, that would be like the, you know, the, the main uh, floor. And it's so important for uh, Muslims when they are performing their prayer to do it together in one floor because we only have one imam and it's so important to be behind this imam and to do it all in a group and be able to hear the imam and, 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 and to see him. So, I know that in, in some other areas in the city, you, you, will, you will see a lot of places of uh, worship. We, we don't even sometimes, you know, we don't call them masjid. We call them like makeshift work, you know, <laughs> worship area. Mm -hmm. Because they just trying to do with whatever they, 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 they find. You know, they rent like a three-story building and it's like small size building or a storefront. 
and they turn it into a praying area because that's all they can get. Now, when you're trying, when when you when you're building something from the ground up, you're building a mosque. Then, this is something that you need to do right. You need to do it that has to look like a mosque. It has to represent a mosque. The only real, you know, looking mosque in the city are, you know, there's very very few. There's like in all of Manhattan, there is one at 96th Street. In the Bronx, this will be the first one. There is no other real mosque in the Bronx. Okay? So, um, the, the programs, now going back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, got, oh. you made them all confused now because they're no, like, there's, we there's in another the message in the Bronx, but it's not built as a message. What, what we're talking about is something that, that, that's built okay. from the ground up. We don't need to that debate whether it's the nine one. <laughs> uh, I, maybe I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not aware of it, but okay. so there are some there, There's allowed more to be another one people. in the Bronx. We but don't need to go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, regarding the uh, program, the uh, program in the uh, classrooms in the, uh, in, the, in the cellar, this is for kids that are attending public schools in the, in the, during the uh, weekdays, and they're from grade one, you know, first grade to uh, uh, seventh grade. And we are uh, putting them in, the, in, in, in this area. Now, they are, the program will consist of the uh, Quran recitation, the interpretation of the Quran, and then the history of Islam and Arabic language, because the Quran is written in Arabic. Now, these are different levels, and you have to teach them like the same way you teach in any, like, you know, public school. You have to uh, divide this into different levels, different classrooms, uh, different teachers, and, and the area that they are using, you know, that uh, open space area in the, uh, in the cellar, it is for these kids to come together, they have lunch together, and in, 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 in our religion, just like in all other religions, you, you teach religion in every aspect of life. Even when they get together and they eat and, and, and every activity that they do, you're trying to teach them something. So that area is important for, for, that, for that reason. Also, that area, I think, became a little bit smaller because we were asked to uh, dedicate an area for like food storage in case you know bring we bring food from outside so that we have a place to to store it so we we chose yeah. you know we took part of that area so that area is not really as big as as, mm -hmm. as you saw it in the plants now now the classes that we call them classrooms in the, in the uh, second floor they are for totally different reasons they are for female youth activities career development uh, home economics, uh, and, 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 and also to help our first you know, generation. We have a lot of uh, people that come in as new immigrants. We teach them, uh, you know, they, 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 they're learning English, they're learning all other essential things that they need to start their lives. And in these rooms, we also have different furniture because you have different, you know, you could have like, sewing machines, you could have uh, some appliances and, and other things that are, you know, part of what you teach these, uh, you know, the, 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 for, for these uh, female activities. So, so you're saying because of the equipment that has to be set up in there, you can't remove the equipment or move it downstairs because the kids who are taking the classes downstairs. That's, that's one room. part. The other part is that they're all going to be there on Saturday. That all, you know, they're, 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 they're going to be taking these classes all day on Saturday, just at the same time the kids are taking, you know, their classes in the, in the, in the, in the, in the cellar. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the uh, classrooms in the second floor are also used during the day sometimes. We have young mothers who cannot come to the, uh, to the mosque and, and participate in any activities uh, during any other day of the, you know, and during any other time except when their kids are in school. This is the only free time they have, and that's the only time they can come and, and attend. So they are also using it during 
during the week, you know, during the week, uh, you know, at smaller number. So the, 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 the two programs are different, and they're different for different use, and they're going to be occupied at the same time uh, on, on Saturday and Sunday. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Understood. Um, we have other questions about the program? No? no. Okay. Thank you very much. He might come back because he's also our parking engineer. Oh, you're a parking engineer. He wears a few. He wears a few hats. Uh, so, really, why don't we go to the parking if it's okay with you, mm -hmm. Madam Chair? Because the parking is really all that's the thrust of the application. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to the community board, and and this is a, a facility and an organization that's very community minded. And uh, their project architect is Bill Salem. He's right here in the front row. Bill, just raise your hand a little bit. He'll speak to you about the design if you want. Uh, Bill is also a member of Community Board 7 in Queens. So he's very sensitive to Community Board where he lives. He's very sensitive to Community Board concerns. And when we were at the Community Board, they were concerned. We were, we were asking to have, originally, the third floor was supposed to go all the way to the street. And it had, we were consequently also asking for more floor area. So we were asking for a couple of thousand more square feet than we were entitled to. And we were asking to violate the sky exposure and the street wall at the front. We have removed both of those at the request of the community board. And they, I, I didn't do it. They did it on their own because they wanted to, to make a nod to the community that they are not trying to disrupt anything. And as Jamil just said, they're around the corner already and they want to blend. Wait, we still so, need a setback <clears throat> waiver. They need a setback waiver because you need a setback waiver. I was going to go to that. <laughs> Because on the right, if you're looking at the right side of the front of the building, I tried to ask Bill what the name was in, in the Muslim religion for the bulbous features up on the right side and left side. He didn't tell me that Minutes. it had anything. There was no term. Minutes. Which, bul which bulbous features? What are they called? Minarets. Minarets? Is that There's the word no for them? Way that you know now you tell me the word. I asked you all day. I've been asking you what the word is. You called it a crucifix oh, before. Sorry. Wait a minute. The little town so those are permitted obstructions. Those are permitted obstructions, evidently. I did not know that. But, actually, but next to them is the um, elevator. Just a little bit of alert because... I don't remember. Was that in Brooklyn? There was Queens. okay. In Queens, it wasn't just, okay. Yeah, just right? Queens. Queens. So just be careful. Uh, okay. So the Bronx is its own domain, right? So, so we had an experience where domes were permitted obstructions, but minarets, oddly, weren't. So Bill, maybe, maybe you should go meet around. with so the commissioner. Minarets first. were viewed as yeah, like maybe, steeples, maybe. and domes were not viewed as anything. So that was not a considered a permitted obstruction. And arguably, the way these minarets are designed, which are really more integral to the building, they look like little mini domes. So careful architect needs to check that. Otherwise, that's right. an added waiver. So well, it's still in there. We didn't remove it from the objection. It's still in your application. And it's still in your application because there is still a small portion of the building. We had assumed those were permitted obstructions. But if you look on the right side, there's an elevator bulkhead that's also a permitted obstruction. But what Bill did architecturally to sort of blend everything is he put a closet between the elevator bulkhead and the minaret to right. sort of create uh, a uniform appearance because he didn't want to take away and start creating three different separate structures up on the roof. Okay. So that was an architectural feature. It gives us a closet. But he did that. That triggers the objection for sure. And he did that as a design feature. And I'm sure if you look at it, you can see what he, did, what he was trying to accomplish. So I would suggest that you make the drawings really clear that you're asking, that you're asking for a waiver from all of those just in case. Yeah, so that right. way when you get to DOB and the plan examiner yeah, doesn't say back. the board only gave you a waiver for this portion of the third floor, you should mark it to the both minarets and the, the elevator. Dome. The, right. the domes and the uh, closet are both are both part of the yeah, area, so yeah. it's clear on the plans because the plans will be marked approved. So that's what was going on at the third floor. The parking, which is, that's all that's really, that's the, uh, that's yes. Amazing. But I, I just forgot, I did have a question mm -hmm. about the third floor. Yeah. You're, you're a rooftop area that's accessed. Oh, right. What is that going to be used for? Is there going to be amplified noise? Is there going to be lighting? There'll definitely be no noise. I don't know. What did you have in mind for the roof? Um, oh, no loudspeakers. Neil? Come on up to speak into the mic. And please state your name again for the record. Jamil Youssef. We uh, complied with, I think, we had some comments at the, at the beginning regarding the, the noise, and uh, we provided the uh, standards that we are going to be using to uh, make, you know, to assure that the, the noise emission for anyone outside the building is not going to be 
you know. Right. This is about the rooftop area. You know, the, the third the floor the roof, rooftop, the, third, the terrace. The, 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 the rooftop, the activities in the rooftop is for like, you know, the the type of activities don't really have noise because we don't we don't have music. We don't have uh, music is not allowed. But and people right. be gathering there. People will go there. People will be gathering there, yeah. and there's so, going to be like sometimes somebody speaking at a microphone like this one, and you know people outside. inside. People inside will hear, but outside won't won't hear because we'll have the same standards for all floors as the main praying right. area. And the main praying area was, you know, the imam is going to be speaking at the microphone. Right. So on the inside, the people will be using microphones, and you're you're having attenuation on your windows and your walls to on prevent walls. the sound from being um, transmitted outside the building. That's right. Right. Our question is about your third floor rooftop setback and whether, so so the issue is with all the variances, what when you're the using the rooftop area for, for gathering, then people are talking. The rooftop is not, is not accessed by... Uh, well, you have a door. You have doors. Two doors. Yeah, please come to the... To the and state your name, please. Uh, my name is Bilal Salim. I'm the architect of record. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry. Well, the rooftop area here is really mostly for um, fresh air. People, they can open the doors. They can get light and ventilation in through the building. It just happens to be a rooftop area because of the setback of the third floor. But is it, a, it's is not, it going to be finished is the question? Will it have just, tile um, down? Just basic for, tile finish. Um, right, so it's not really a gathering space. Nothing on our certificate of occupancy will show it as a gathering space. Mm -hmm. Just mostly for ventilation. They open the doors, right. the windows. But it'll have a live load to allow people to access it. it right? There will be a live load. So, so how can you resist when you have a nice outdoor area? You want to go out. You want to... Breathe if, the air, if right? We could possibly, if we're not if, saying that you necessarily have to eliminate it, it because of the uses that are surrounding this building, they're not the same kind of arguably. That's the question. Are the uses that surround the building the sensitive type of uses like residences where that would become a nuisance, right? So, normally, what we do with houses of worship is we ask that all the activities stay inside the building. Hence the sound attenuation on the windows and so on. Um, no use of loudspeakers that could be heard outside the building, and no use of the outdoor spaces for congregating. In other words, that you don't have what you currently have, which is well, hundreds I, of people on the you sidewalk. Know, it's really, it's more of the. I mean, that came about to be because of the setback and because right. so that we can reduce the floor area. Um, to comply Understood. with, uh, right. Understood. So that came more of an afterthought. We didn't actually yeah. have it in our program. So as, one as way for you something. to handle it is to make it such that it doesn't accommodate a lot of people. So for instance, you could put landscaping out there where it, there's so much effectively furniture mm -hmm. that there's no place, there's only place for 10 people to stand as yeah, opposed to what it looks like I now. Mean, 40 people can stand there. Obviously our, you know, Communities uses all are within the building. There's nothing really that's going to happen on that roof right. deck um, But I think that's definitely a good idea mm -hmm. And, and I, I would that say the same goes for the second floor also second floor also has a rooftop area Which is in the rear Correct correct. Well, that's more of like a um, I guess I that's could have worded like it differently yeah, um, Instead of calling it a rooftop yeah. area. I could have called it maybe access area because we do have the skylights there, right, I'm right. and obviously we still have, we're but not done with our design. you don't need a door, you can right. just have operable windows that will take care That's of the necessary yes. ventilation yes. space. So yes, that, that, that one should be labeled as inaccessible to the public, okay. you know, for and, maintenance only, okay. and that the material on the roof wouldn't be arguable. I mean, it's nice to have a good material on the roof, but for instance, you could do a green roof, something that people don't walk on, Okay. right? I'll take that into consideration, thank okay. you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. While you're there, uh, there's just a couple of corrections. Um, in the, uh, I think the property depth and uh, width have been reversed uh, compared to what's in the plan. Are you talking about what's my proposed, my, on the statement Where? of facts or yeah. my plan? Yeah. Okay. Because it's uh, nine, it's a hundred wide by ninety five deep. deep. Yes. Hundred wide, and I think uh, it, it's reversed somewhere okay. in the. And what are the materials of the building? Um, well, we're proposing to have, it's a uh, 
masonry building. So we're going to have split, plate, spit, split face block on the exterior and on the back. And on the front, we're doing brick and stone facade, a brick veneer. Brick veneer. OK, split face block and brick veneer. On the sides and on the rear and on the front, brick so veneer. So can you um, label the drawings to show the materials? Absolutely. Um, the, the main reason that I asked for this is sort of a theme of mine. When we're building a building that's going to be here much longer than we are, and the, and the idea, especially in the case of public institutions like this, is they should be a contribution to the community. So should the materials. They should Absolutely. be a contribution. Okay. Right? I will add those okay. plans. Thank you. Um, yeah, we, so the parking still haven't. And, yeah, and uh, I'll ask Bill to, to okay. stay up as well. And Jamil is here. He created the traffic study. Mm -hmm. So obviously we're asking you to, to waive the entire part. Mm -hmm. the parking. There's 40 spaces would be required, which is based on, as you know, in the occupancy of the largest gathering space, uh, which would be the first floor. <laughs> We're asking for a waiver of the parking. We're asking for a waiver of the parking for a couple of reasons. The first reason is, as Jamil said before, we're not introducing something new into the neighborhood. Phone call. <laughs> we are right around the corner right now with the same number of congregants that, although Commissioner Ali Brown missed it, are there every Friday praying in the street. And there is no huge traffic or parking problem from the cars. There's a problem for all the people in the street. It's the people, of course, not the cars. So we're not, and that played out at the community board. We got community board support. We're not over, right. no, you didn't see anything about that. The problem we have with the parking providing is twofold. First of all, obviously, we want the space for ourselves. We need the space for people. But second of all, we're on rock. And I didn't even know this until I was just, you came up yesterday and Bill, I was talking to Bill, and Bill's like, we're on top of boulders. He's like, I can't go anywhere to do anything. It's tough enough just to get the, the, the seller in the way that we got the seller, and he thinks it's, it's tough. And I'll let Bill talk to you about that a little bit. So it's hard. We can't go any deeper than we are right now. We can't, he's as deep as he can go with what he's got. So we're asking to waive the parking. I, we think it's a, a modest request to waive the parking given where we are, which is really at this nub of a commercial zone on this block that's got the elevated train trestle on it. It's, it's got some residential to our right, but the rest of the block is really like a no man's land kind of block. So it's it's not active in the times that they're active on the weekends. Uh, Bill did a traffic, a parking study, found that there's right. plenty of parking in the area. So, so. so the, the real question, because we often has, have houses of worship where we're asked to waive the parking, where we look at what percentage of the congregation lives within walking distance, right? What, what we're trying to understand here is because this is really a commercial area, um, and the, print, the, the peak usage time is really Friday afternoon, the question was, um, aren't most of the people coming from from working in the area no, as opposed no. to coming from home? They're coming, I'll let, I'll let Jabil yeah. explain it, but no, they are coming from their homes. I think I we, uh, Jamil Youssef, we conducted a uh, survey of our congregates and we built a, a database. And now we have, we, we think we have most of their names, addresses, and 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 number of people in household and and uh, all this information, we we know for for a fact that these people, you know, based on their addresses, that live in the area. Uh, most of our community uh, work outside of this area. Um, we 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 know that because it's a small community. Everybody knows. Almost everybody else, and uh, and 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 a lot of people can testi testify to that. In addition to the survey that we did and the addresses that we collected and the database, and it's uh, we have it and and we can make it uh, available. Right, right. So we don't want to see the addresses, but we I think we already have a map that shows yes the sort of the general scope yes. of where people live. Mm -hmm. um, but my question really is, if if the peak hours are Friday, yes. unless everyone in the congregation is lucky enough to have a job where they don't have to work on Fridays, wouldn't, wouldn't people be coming from work, therefore not walking from home? Well, I know that 
in our case, you know, different than uh, Christians and, and Jews that we have Friday and Friday is a work day. And you will be surprised how many people make all kinds of arrangements in order to take one hour and two hours uh, off from work to, uh, to come to the, uh, you know, to come and, and attend the prayer. Um, right, but they're coming from off-site. As a, so if they live in the neighborhood, we totally they, understand they, they walk, that they're yes. work, walking from home. Yes. Even but if, if they're taking two hours off from work, they're coming from off-site. No, well, if, if, they're, if they're working like a, a long distance from the, uh, from the mosque, usually go, uh, people go to the nearest mosque to them. Like I, I work in Manhattan. I work like, you know, near Madison Square Garden. I go to a mosque on uh, Broadway and 29th Street. Mm -hmm. I cannot go to the Bronx to... Uh, so then at that. that peak time for the people who don't get Fridays, a big block of time on Fridays off, right? Many of the people who will be coming during that peak Friday time are, are potentially not your usual congregants who live in the neighborhood. Those would be the people who come on Friday night, you, right? You... you if if we, made, if we do a survey of the people in, in, in our community and the kind of businesses that they run, you will see that most of our community are really in a small business type of work. Who, who and will have the businesses in the neighborhood? Not in the neighborhood. And they can, control, they can control their time. They take a few hours off and they come to, you know, they, they, they live in the area, they take a few uh, uh, you know, uh, hours off, they go and they bring their family they bring their uh, like 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 a wife and, and 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 their neighbor or or someone like that, and they come to the to, to the mosque. They perform the prayer. Yeah, they yeah. perform the prayer, <laughs> and then they uh, and then they go back to uh, whatever they want to do. Okay, uh, that, well, that's what we're trying to understand. Yes, they have to get. Are they going home first and park the car and then walk to the mosque? And then they walk home and they get the car and yes. they leave? Or are they walking to the subway? What, how, what's going on? Yes, Sama lives in the area. Okay. And uh, he's been living in the area for, 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 for a long time. And I think he knows more about the people movement. Okay. State your name, please. My name is uh, Osama al -Sui, And I live one block away from the current center. Uh, half a block away, the, um, one block away from the new center. Um, basically, with the, the Muslim community during Fridays, because it's a major part of the daily life Friday uh, service, a lot of people arrange their lifestyle and their work uh, around the prayer. For me, as an example, I actually, on Friday, uh, different, my work schedule is different than the rest of the week, which I start work after prayer. So I'll actually attend, which they have two services over there right now, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, and I'll actually attend the first service, then I will actually go to work. So a lot of people that are in the area, they actually cultivate their work around the schedule of the, of the, of the center, around the schedule of the prayer. So that's one of the major things. And if you come, we, you know, if you come into the area, which I think you missed, <laughs> if you come around 12 o'clock and 1 o'clock, you will definitely see uh, hundreds of people walking literally to the to the center and if they're not coming walking if they are coming from a little f uh, further away which they have to use transportations trains or buses or they will actually come by cab drop them off and they will get picked up by cabs carpooling to the center so that's a major thing with the with the mosques is they actually because it's a very very important thing and it's a mandatory for a person to attend Friday services in Muslim faith they actually cultivate their, their, their work schedule around the prayer. And, and, and one thing about the prayer is, uh, to Muslims, they cannot miss three consecutive you know, Fridays. So if, if in the faith, you actually must, it's, it's mandatory to attend. So they will actually bend over backward with work with their employer just to make sure if they can take off a whole day off uh, Friday, and I've tried that before, <laughs> and you'll, and you you'll try to take off so, just so you can manage and attend the Friday prayer. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, that's very helpful. Thank you. Very enthusiastic crew, as you could see. Everybody's very uh, in tune with each other and uh, very dedicated to their goals. Okay, great. Does that answer people's questions? Um, I just needed one clarification, which was the, what I, what I understood was the current size was 500 congregants 
And the plan is for 800 congregants. Let me explain the 500, 800 discrepancy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, to put it back into, uh, into any other religion, every religion has its daily people coming. As I just learned, I never knew that, that you can't miss three and you get kicked out of the club. I didn't know that. Yeah. I think I'd be kicked out of my club already if I guess I've missed more than three. Uh, but the, there are the major holidays where everybody shows up at the same time. Right. Like, and that's the 800 number. So the 500 is the uh, daily number of people that Commissioner Holly Brown missed in the street the other day. The 800 is on the major holidays. That's when you get 800 people showing up. You say everybody at the same time. Sorry, sorry. That's okay. So that's the distinction between the two. We're not looking at any massive growth immediately, but having said that, they've had tremendous growth since uh, 1998. They started off with 180 people, and now they're at 800 people. So there'll be growth every year, but we're not building for the growth. We're building to accommodate what we have. Right. Okay. Understood. Thank you. Okay. I don't think we have any other questions here. So are there speakers on this? Yes, please. Please state your name for the record. You have three minutes. Oh, three minutes. Good evening, everyone. My name is Yahe Obeid. You all look energetic and great, except for our lawyer. He looks a little <laughs> tired. I think you guys have the advantage here. But uh, I'm on the local community board, but I'm also on the mosque board, so I'm not here to speak for the community board. So the views expressed here are mines and the mosques and not necessarily of the community board. Okay. So with that being said, um, we need the center. We, we just recently, we've had an immigration workshop an assemblyman, a city councilman, and, and uh, sorry, I'm just tired. It's been a long day, as you all know. Um, just, yes, we're both just tired. Just breathe. Breathing is a good thing. Yeah. So we've had events for drugs and gangs, and, um, also a blood drive just recently in the summer. And for our community, as you know, we have the Morris Park to our west, the Van Ness to our east, and they both have associations. And we joined them. And my goal when I joined the community board was to integrate our community with the local community. And we've done a great job. I think we have about 10 people that attend each association. It's, been, it's worked out great. So we know LaGuardia Airport, just as an example. When it was built 50 years ago, they didn't build it for the future. They just built it for that time. And we now struggle. Thank God I don't work at LaGuardia. I just moved out, went to, <laughs> back to Kennedy. So, but uh, when you see the worshipers praying on the sidewalk, I have a video of them praying in slush. They're just sitting there on the sidewalk in slush. It's so depressing. When they get up and their jeans are wet and it's cold. I mean, every time I watch that video, it, it makes me tear up. And I watch it and I, I, you know, it's very, very disappointing. I don't think it's fair for anyone to pray in these conditions. Not just in the cold, but in slush and wet rain because you can't put people away. And as a volunteer, last, last Friday I had off from my job and I worked the traffic. I tried to move the, the vehicles. Everyone followed direction. Everyone's great. And I go up there and I make an announcement and I say, the future of the community depends on you following the rules and following the law. And I've called the precinct, and I've had the precinct come and issue five tickets to individuals where I said, please don't park here. He says, I gotta go, I wanna catch the prayer, because I, and I, they got tickets. So we've taught the community. Whether the ones that understood, understand, trust me, they'll take the train, they'll walk. I live about six blocks away, about a four minute walk, and I've offered people, because my, my, my parking area allows for 15 vehicles, and I tell the people that don't have um, parking, go park at my house. Fifth block down, make a left, you see the American flag, park anywhere on the driveway. And I, that, that's what I tell people all the time. And I also offer my parking, not just to the mosque, but the, to the school, the local uh, public school, because they had issues with parking. I offered four parking spots for free. The teachers don't have to pay me for it. They can just come and park. So just to be, uh, you know, part of the community. Okay. So, so the, your time is up, so if you could just quickly wrap up. But, all right. Um, well, we would expect okay. there to be a parking monitor here, too, to make sure that parking doesn't become a... Yes. We're, we're, it's, it's urgent, and if, if the, the precinct has been working with us, 
they'll come out, they'll have two vehicles there, the vehicles will you know, tell people to go away or they'll issue tickets. Our community, they, they understand. The way you, if you tell them, don't park here, they won't do it. They won't do it. And the people that don't follow the, the law, we don't want them part of our community and we tell them that. I tell them if you broke the law and you parked illegally, please do not come back here again. That's how I feel and every, the Imam feels the same way. And uh, talking about the nearest mosque, I work in Queens. I attend any mosque, the local mosque, any mosque I can just grab a hold of. The Van Wick and park in there is, is horrendous too. I don't think there's a park in anywhere. But um, with that being said, I'll end it with what he said the three Fridays. I guess it's universal, two strikes in, or three strikes and you're out. So, so I hope uh, you understand that part. And that's mm -hmm. all I got. I hope you have, if you have any questions for me, Thank I can you. answer them on Thank the community you. side. Thank you. Thank you. Other speaker? State your name, please. Yeah, Manal Mustafa. Okay, I live also around the area. I'm a little nervous, so <laughs> bear Just with me. Calm, <laughs> breathe. Okay. Um, I've been living in that area for 27 years. I have six children my own, and um, when they were five years old, uh, they get their education in the same uh, Bronx Community Center, and now uh, they can speak three languages, Arabic, English, and Spanish. And um, I have a six years old, and he's attending the same, the same center, and I would like him to continue so he can learn my culture my language, and I would like him also um, to be in any occasions, me, him, and all my family. It's really sad um, that in many Friday prayers, I can't um, attend because when I told my husband, take me with you, he will say, oh, we don't have space. It's only for men because it's mandatory for men. For women, you can do it at home. But this is the time is like when you get your blessing. And, and really, I don't want to miss that. I want to do it all the time. And also, this is the time where when I don't have the time to meet with my friends because, okay, I attend college, I have children, I have things to do, to care of. This is the time for me when I can meet with those, you know, ladies. Number two, as a, as a Muslim and as my, my native language is Arabic, I would like to see all, my, all the girls like me and all the women like me, they can communicate and they can social. I don't like them. You know, when they go to, to any place and they want to do the, the, the little things, the easiest thing, that they can't communicate because they can't speak English. They know immigrant, they can't speak well English, and they, you know, like they struggle. In this center, with all the programming that they have, it's a lot of help for everybody like me, the new generation, and the, the new people that they come in along. And, you know, just I came today, like, okay, for the whole day, leaving everything behind. <laughs> I didn't even, uh, my little one, if he had his, his, his lunch or his dinner or he did his homework, you know, just to be, to present the other woman that I know they have the same feeling as I do. And thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other speakers? Okay. Eric, yeah. Patrick, you, you're very lucky. You have jobs that uh, can make a real difference in people's lives. And I think what these people are doing is what we should have every block in New York City filled with. I mean, I heard these people speak, and I'd like to have them as neighbors. I, I think I want to convert. I, 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 really. I mean, they, they, they've got, they have such a good attitude on everything that they're doing. And it's nice. To, it's just refreshing to see. So, Eric, um, we're missing some information that's critical to the findings. Which one? Which is the data on impact on neighborhood character. You didn't discuss it at all in the findings. We so um, with respect to the height and setback waiver. And, and since we're talking about the minarets and the dome, that just needs to be folded into the conversation, right? And this is just something that's that's necessary for yeah, us no, to we, be able to make Sure, of course it should be in there and we'll okay. put it in. Um, and then we needed the, a clarification on the number of total families in the congregation, the total number of congregants, which really isn't the same thing, right? Because there's... No, it's 500 right? congregants and then there are families, so yeah. Right, and, and... We don't want names and addresses. No, 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 just the numbers. We're just talking numbers. How many kids attend the program, I think, actually is It's about there. 300, but yeah, yeah but um, we'll clarify that. Right, and then the total number of congregants anticipated to attend the 
Friday prayers, which I think you just clarified. You said it's Friday. It's 500 and then 800 and on the big holidays. Ramadan. So, um, okay. And let's see. I think that really was... Oh. The planes, the planes the yeah, no, I'll go through the list notes for you right now to, to fix the balconies. Uh, the it's yeah. discussion, put notes on the plans to reflect the, the uh, setback. Uh, yeah, notes on the plans words, for, the, the, for the, setback. the setback. Setback and the materials. Setback materials. The floor to floor heights, there were some right. inconsistencies on the drawings. So just listen to the tape yesterday. Yes. We, we had, there were just some technical glitches in the drawings, so just correct those. And with regards to the parking count, how the parking count is being uh, determined based on the largest occupancy, that also needs to be clarified. Madam Chair. Right. Oh. Right. Yeah. We're still waiting for the revised EAS. Oh, right. Okay. Please submit the revised EAS. Um, just going back to the parking, though, you do need to kind of do the parking analysis based on that revised number. The revised 800? The, uh, no, uh, the, the ca capacity. The capacity of the of, rated capacity of, of the, the largest oh, room. Oh, that's, that's the other thing that was confusing. In your as-of-right drawings, you use seven square foot per person. Yes. And in your we'll proposed, you're only using ten, you're using ten, right? So I think the buildings department has been accepting seven square feet, and I think probably given your the size of the congregation, you're probably going to be using seven square feet. So that should be your calculation. Well, if we were to to go by the building code, yes, we are allowed to have seven for uh, unconcentrated not fixed seating. Right. Um, but as far as my calculations were concerned, my occupancy load calculations, yes, I did take 10. You took Although so you we did are that able to use the 7. So you were right. more conservative. We were conservative in our numbers, and we took 10 square Okay. Feet. So it was just that because the statement of facts um, talks about 7 square feet, and the as of right talks about 7, and then the proposed is 10. So the buildings department is the one that needs to decide, needs to agree with you on what it is that you're doing as a capacity, because for your both for your egress requirements well, make also. Make it easy. Yeah, make it but but um, but I know that I know that. Well, for parking, it's based on rated capacity, yeah. Yeah. and the rated capacity is actually either what it says in the building code or what the buildings department agrees is your capacity, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. if, for example. You know, we see, we see a lot of different kinds of mosques. Some of them really squish everybody in, and some of them use um, carpeting that just says this is the size, right? right? So no more than what the carpet says, and that if that turns out to be 10 square feet, then that's the number, right? So it's really for you <coughs> to determine what it is you're going to be describing to the Department of well, Buildings. Well, if you look on page P1, Mm -hmm. You can see on my calculations here that I am taking the largest room of 596 persons. Mm -hmm. I'm dividing that by 15 square, 15 square feet per person, which gave me um, 40 required parking spaces. Okay. So that's where we're getting the 40. I think yeah. then the statement of fact needs to be corrected yeah. because it, it used 475 okay. as the rated capacity okay. to right. and used 25. I mean, so this this information right. that he's okay. Right. Okay. And I think, therefore, that's it. Okay, so let me see. Can we put this on? What do we have left on, in January? Anything? No. You're filled right. up in January already. Wow. Hey, hey. Unfortunately, that's where we are. So January 30th, because this isn't big, right? So I think we still have room, right, January 30th, because it's not a big one? Yeah, this one should be light, right? We have no opposition Right, okay. Here. So then we can put this on for, um, I think we can put this on for decision, no? It? But we can't, yeah, we can put it on for decision, but we don't have the EAS, right? No, I We don't have the EAS. We don't have the EAS, yeah, right? And the EP also okay. has not weighed in oh, on right. the... Oh, right, we don't have that. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Good, okay. good evening, Hiram Rothberg. The, the EAS was uh, delivered to uh, Eric's office last night. Okay. Uh, it includes uh, a full ha it includes a full air quality hazardous material noise and uh, land use zoning and public policy. Uh, the only outside concern that I have is that upon review, uh, even though the phase one didn't make any recommendation recommendations for further review, that. Uh, uh, DEP sometimes doesn't doesn't care about what the phase one recommendations are and just requires soil testing sometimes. 
So that, that's, a, right. that's, that's an outside possibility. Okay. We, Otherwise, I don't see any other issues. And just worst case scenario, if, if the reviews are still going on. Mm. Look, no, no, but no, we don't but have also the window wall, the continuation yeah. all the phase one, one right? right. right. Okay. So let, let's just put it on for continued and that. We can always close and vote if we have that's everything great. in Thank place. You. Okay. So we're going to put this on for continued on January 30th um, with your submission. The 10th, right? With your submission on the 10th of January. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. That's really Thanks appreciated. Thanks for working so late. for waiting. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, move It's like a community board meeting. See you later. We're leaving. Goodbye. Yes. Come <laughs> Please stay in quietly. Exit the hearing room. We have ongoing hearing. Is this the last one? Yes. Yes. I know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, but yeah, what can I tell you? Item number four, 2017-23 BZ. Let's move out and let's bring everybody else in. Quickly, quickly, please. We've only got the room soon. It's already almost 8 o'clock. Let's go. You know. Yeah. We don't know that everyone. No, I thought only 14 people wanted to speak as opposed to all. Well, only speakers. one elected official is left. The others left. Okay. Oh, well. I need to see if Sarah can. You got a if team the applicant speaking? can please uh, go to the diet there so we can, we can begin. Yeah, let's start. Podium. Podium? Podium. Oh, sorry. I have a lot. Wait, okay. he's not in here yet. Where's the applicant? Where's David? Where's David? Did he leave? Let me go get it. Okay. What's wrong? Please quickly take seats. What's wrong? Where's the opposite? Where's Ron the mill? What's going on here? Otherwise, we'll put it on for tomorrow call. Yeah, we, are, we only have the room until 9 p.m., so... We've got to move quickly, people. We only got the room for another hour. Sorry. Another we only got one hour. It's got to be quick. Go. Applicant, I've already called the case. Let's go. Good evening, Commissioners. Ron Mandel of Davidoff, Hutcher, and Citroen for the applicants. We attended yesterday's review session and understand and appreciate the comments and questions that were raised. Uh, for the sake of brevity, we'd like to address the larger issues that were, were raised by the Commission um, and follow up subsequent to this hearing with a written submission to further detail the cases we're going to cite and the further information the Board needs. So first, with respect, we'd like to address the ownership and the controlling parties to the zoning lot. Second, I'd like to address the existing built conditions relative to the, to the property. Third, I'd like to ask Joshua Beauregard, the headmaster of Unity Prep, to briefly address the program needs of the school and the importance of having the school at this location. And lastly, I'd like to ask Jake Elganian, uh, an active school board member, to address the school's search for a site and why it's important to be located within this community district. First, on the issue of ownership, to clarify the property owner's Class and Avenue Housing Development Fund, which is held under the auspices under the umbrella organization of Impact Brooklyn, Sorry. an owner, operator, and advocate of affordable housing in, in Brooklyn. Quincy Street Owners is the party that has the right to develop the undeveloped portion of the zoning lot, which is currently occupied by accessory parking to the residential building. And lastly, Unity Preparatory Charter School of Brooklyn is the charter school proposed to be the lessee in this proposed school building on the lot. So before you go on about the ownership, Classen Avenue has the ownership, right? Title holder. Title holder, but according to um, whatever document it is that's recorded on ACRIS, it's Quincy Street Owners LLC that has all the beneficial interests in the property 
um, which is a for-profit corporation, which includes basically all the rights to everything. I'm, I'm assuming Quincy Street was the market rate developer, and yes. Classen is the HDFC Correct. that is doing the inclusionary zoning on Correct. this site, and that's why they have this ownership. C Correct. So, so Quincy Street owners, a well-related entity, was affiliated with the construction of the affordable building. They sold the the related entity sold the property to Classen Avenue HDFC, aka Impact, mm -hmm. who oper who owns and operates the building. Quincy Street owners, I understand, has the benef beneficial interest to the undeveloped portion where the school is going. That's not what it actually says. I, I'll have to the, get some more information regarding that. The document says the entire site. It, um, Quincy Street owners has the beneficial interest in the entire site. That's the so we'll, cl we'll okay. provide additional information regarding that issue. Mm -hmm. okay. In terms of the status of the built conditions on the zoning lot, the southern portion of the zoning lot, the portion that fronts Quincy Street, is occupied by the six-story residential building, uh, which has 48 dwelling units, which is managed by, by Impact Brooklyn. The existing building was built in 2006, pursuant to the then R6 district regulations. Um, as you may be aware, pursuant to the R6 district regulations, the max FAR was 4.8, with a community facility and a residential use on the zoning lot. In 2007, the site was rezoned as part of the Fort Greene Clinton Hill rezoning, which effectively downzoned the site from a 4.8 to a 2.0, regardless of whether or not there's community facility on the zoning lot. As it relates to the ownership issue, it's important to note that based upon BSA precedent and New York decision law, the issue of ownership as raised in the letters submitted to the board are irrelevant. Um, we attest that it's in, you know, an obfuscation. There exist numerous BSA cases that have authorized the A finding to be based on program needs when there's a for-profit owner on the zoning lot and a not-for-profit lessee. And we will be providing the board with details regarding those cases that were awarded by the board. Just preliminarily, uh, I'd like to point out to, to two cases, BSA calendar number 38203BZ. In that case, there was a private property owner. The lessee was FIT. And the board did grant the variance to authorize FIT um, to use a lot as a dorm. Uh, in that case, FIT was permitted to rely on programmatic needs and its not-for-profit status, although it was a lessee. There's also 30409BZ, again, similar situation where the private owner was a for-profit, sorry, the property owner was a for-profit, and the lessee, woman in need, uh, also relied on programmatic needs and the not-for-profit status to satisfy the findings under 72-21. Can you tell us what the case numbers are again? Sure. 30409BC and 38203BC. Thank you. <laughs> to that point, since the future occupant is a school, the standards in which findings A and B are met need to be guided by this precedent. Of course, the school does have to justify its program needs, um, which we'll elaborate on further on in the, in the hearing. <clears throat> to the second point, with respect to the issue of multiple buildings on the zoning lot, I understand that the board questioned whether the existing buildings bulk contributed to the relief requested and whether it's entitled to deference under the Cornell rubric. To that point, programs entitled to deference do not have to show their programmatic need would be satisfied if the other buildings in the zoning lot did not exist. That's also been noted in numerous BSA cases, which we'll cite to in our, in our future submission. In those cases, the not-for-profit institutions, similar to Unity Prep in this case, were entitled to the program needs deference standard, despite being a lessee in a zoning lot, and although there was another existing building on the zoning lot as well. In those BSA cases, the applicant did not have to show how the lack of the existing building would impact their programmatic needs. To that point, most recently, the board did grant a variance under BSA calendar number 117-14BZ, which is filed on behalf of Trinity School. In that case, Trinity School occupied a zoning lot. On that zoning lot was another building, a residential building, similar to our situation. The board granted a variance whether there was multiple uses on the same zoning lot, um, and the school was not required to show that the program could expand if the housing wasn't there. And just to clarify, the housing was not part of the, the Unity campus. It was a separate development altogether. Importantly, the proposed school building, if approved by the board, can only occupied, be occupied by the school. 
And I'm sure you appreciate that any change in use to the school, any change in configuration, the future applicant will have to come back to the board and amend their application and again, satisfy the findings and demonstrate that the building is appropriate to satisfy their program needs. So I think that's also an important thing to know. This is not a, a building that you know, can be converted someday in the future to a condominium. It can only be a school building for this particular use. And again, any changes in the future have to be approved by the board pursuant to the findings under 7221. But the building will already have been built. So what if the school goes out of business or moves out? Then there you've got a building. And so it'll come back to the board asking to be an office building or who knows what, right? The reality is that the school is planning on a long-term lease so long that it actually qualifies for real Everybody estate tax exemption. Best laid plans, right? God laughs, laughs at the best laid plan. You're absolutely right, Chair. Right. <laughs> but, but the reality is that you know, the board has done this in the past. Their resolution is contingent upon a certain use being in the building. Mm -hmm. There are other resolutions which require a certain applicant to come back to the board. Sorry, for, a, for a, a future applicant to come to the board if there's a change in, in ownership or use of the building. So I don't see why that can't be done in this particular case. Okay. So what do we do about the absence of any floor area whatsoever on the site? Mm. A point, a point that I'd like to make the board aware of is that the existing building's lot coverage is 32.5%. And I think there's a lot of oversight as it relates to that issue. The max lot coverage in this district is 60%. With the school building, the proposed lot coverage is 66.8%, which in my layman you know, understanding of, uh, of, of zoning, and in, in, in site design, it is a modest request above the maximum permitted lot coverage. No, I think you can't just look at lot coverage. Area. Floor, area. floor area, area is the one. I'm not talking about lot coverage. We often have schools that need a little bit of extra lot coverage or a little heightened setback wave or something like that, right? We never have schools that have zero floor area available on the zoning lot. They wouldn't even actually have a conversation with the, the broker. Like, why would a broker show them a site that has zero floor area? I really don't get that. No development capability at all for any use. Here's this great vacant lot with no development capability. I'm having so much trouble even understanding how the school got to this site. Section 7221 doesn't require that we just focus on floor area. No, no, I think no. it's important to look at all the bulk waivers that are being sought in, re in relation to what's being there, to, what's there today. 7221 also says that if you have a hardship that was provided by a predecessor in interest, you aren't entitled to a variance. So if the result of prior contracts at the site was that you have zero floor area available, how do you get over that hurdle? You get over it the same way every other variance for a school was filed with the board and approved by the board in the sense that you can't divorce you know, the, the, the C finding from the deference afforded to a not-for-profit educational institution. Like, like most other variances that are approved by the board for a school, the, the self-created hardship, it's, it's the program needs of the school that are driving the request being made. And like every other variance approved by the board, the board hasn't determined that to be a self-created hardship. The school's job is to prove every, to justify every single square foot that's being proposed and why they need it. Okay. And we can do that. Can you so, provide a site to a case where the board has given deference and approved a variance for a site that the board acknowledged was a self-created hardship? If that was the case, then I think any variance approved for a school seeking a floor area waiver wouldn't be approved. No. So in a situation where a school purchases a site and the site has development capabilities that only go up to X amount, uh, mm -hmm. X amount of lot, lot coverage, X, Y amount of floor area, et cetera. And it needs waivers because it has a gym, it has classrooms, it needs a laboratory, that kind of thing. And it needs more floor area. And the site itself always existed as a site with this allowable zoning. That's a, that's a site where no hardship has been created by a predecessor in title. In this situation, and in another case that we have before us right now, um, the development deal was such that the developer opted to strip the land of any development capability. Um, and that's a development decision. 
strip the land of the development capability for future use of a vacant site. And so that's a decision and, and um, created, created a lot with no capability except of being a parking lot or a place to put a nice bench and some trees. I don't see how this is any different than the Trinity case the board approved. In the Trinity case I cited to earlier, and again, I can elaborate subsequent so to this hearing. the Trinity case that you're citing to in 2014 um, is actually an existing building that was built a very long time ago associated with an urban renewal plan where there was a big apartment building built, mm -hmm. um, all part of one concept, right? So it's actually, you need to go back and look at the history of the Trinity site. It goes back extremely far. Mm -hmm. um, and it was not deprived of any of its development capability. The Trinity School is an enormous school, and it was not um, built pursuant to waivers for 100% of its floor area. It wasn't, but again, there's nothing, there's nothing that requires us to only look at floor area. You can't distinguish floor area from other waivers as well. With the Trinity case, and the Trinity case, I guess, is analogous in the sense that Trinity was there, then a residential building was built, Trinity comes back, to the BSA asking for waivers to enlarge its school building. I think it's very similar to our case in the sense that, in the sense that they're asking for bulk waivers, we're asking for bulk waivers. Why would Florida be treating different than rear yard or height or setback? Because the bulk the, waivers were unrelated to the residential building. The bulk waivers were specifically for the school and the residential building didn't go to its issues with lot coverage, which was its and height and setback, which were its issues. Chair, with all due respect, if the residential building wasn't an issue, the school wouldn't go to the board for any relief. The existing site conditions on that zoning lot necessitated the need to come to the board for relief. If they could do it as of right, because there's nothing else on the zoning lot, they wouldn't need the board. We're not asking if there's to treat it as if there was nothing else on the zoning lot. We're saying that the zoning lot was fully developed, fully developed. That's it. Made it. The developer made a decision. Fully developed. Didn't leave any left over for another little building to be put there, right? And so, um, so that's it. Stripped. And but but why was that concern? That's like the end of the story. And I don't know how to get any further because it's completely created by the developer. And what you're proposing is that the developer gets to go back to the well and create new floor area because the developer perceives that there's an opportunity to create floor area via a variance and um, essentially cure the, the development decision that was made when it decided to build in 2006 or whenever it was, the, the residential building. Right, and, and at the time, like you mentioned, when it was zoned R6, it would have been permitted with a community facility to build up to 4.8, but the zoning changed. and. And the developer at that time could have done whatever it needed to retain that floor area or ask for not rezoning, but that was not pursued. It ended up being rezoned. And now to go back and say it was R6 and there was a contemplation, and now we are going to exercise that. Because this is a sophisticated That's developer who could have vested under the 4.8 yeah. had he or he chosen to do so. To, to my earlier point, I think the two fundamental issues are whether a not-for-profit lessee can afford itself of the deference entitled pursuant to the Cornell case. We know that's not an issue. A lessee is entitled to deference and can use their program needs to satisfy the A finding. We also know based upon other BSA you know, cases no, that were approved. We haven't seen the conditions, the lease actually. So what kind of a lease is it? Is it a lease that's equivalent to ownership where I, I think the boards looked at very, very long-term leases that it, are the equivalent and not something that has an option to new, renew in five years and that kind of thing. In fact, we had another case like that where the option to renew was soon. And, um, and then, then where would we be, right? So we were looking at extremely long-term leases that are the equivalent of ownership. We have not seen any kind of an agreement Understood. with the school here. Um, and so, but I don't, so, um, the concept of deference notwithstanding, we still have the self-created hardship problem, and there is no deference to overcome the self-created hardship. And so I would say that the focus of your work should be in tr persuading the board, if you can, that somehow or other this was not a self-created hardship 
I have no idea how you're going to do that. And especially because we currently have a case um, in hearing where that exact subject came up. It was heavily discussed, and um, you could learn from that one. Listen Again, that I, th one. I think it's important, and we'd like the opportunity to submit sure. um, and explain how this case is some of the other cases the board has approved where there are other buildings, non-educational, non-religious institutions on the same zoning lot, and the board nonetheless had the authority to grant the variance. And again, we can't distinguish between the various types of waivers. Just to be really precise, it's not just about there being other buildings on the zoning lot. It's about the developmental capacity of the zoning lot. There, there being no development capacity. We understand. The zoning lot. And, and the action of the developer, that made that the decision. predecessor in title, that made the decision to do those things and then coming to the board seeking waivers when the developer has already done the things that stripped the development of its development capability, right? That's the specific question. So in this case, oh. I mean, the action of the developer didn't strip, at the time it was owned R6, it didn't strip of the development capacity. You could Correct. have built a community facility only, there. Only if you As long as it was, uh, right, R6. So. So We're talking about just... very, very sophisticated developers here. This is not, you know, some people trying this out. This is very sophisticated developers who knew about the rezoning, who could have gotten their foundations in the ground to vest under the extra floor area for community facility and opted not to. I mean, one could say it's kind of like a developer who sells off some of his development rights, thinking they have some left over and then they're caught in the down zoning. And oh, well. Yeah. That yeah, is right. it's a, a self-created hardship. You then can't come to the board and say, well, I need more development rights because I sold those off thinking I had some. Before I, I ask the headmaster to come and address the programming to the school, I'd like to make a point. You know, zoning doesn't look at the individual. It's look at the zoning lot, the zoning status, and what 7221 provides. What do you mean the owner doesn't No, I mean, that you, made a, you, you made a point that you know, it's a savvy developer. And, listen, I, no, so this has to do with the history of development, right? So it... So the hardship can have been caused by a predecessor in title. So we look at who was the predecessor in title, what did the predecessor do, and, you know, sometimes we maybe feel a little bit for the predecessor in title who might not have been aware of something, whatever, we, that may be a conversation that's had. It's often made, and arguments are often made, oh, you know, my mom, she didn't really understand anything about zoning, and so we don't need to have that conversation because we know this developer understood a lot about zoning. So to, to my earlier point, no school would come to the board and seek any relief if, 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 if the self-created hardship was an issue. The fact is, it, it's the program needs of the school that are driving the relief, just like every other variance the board has approved. Just like here, the school needs certain things to achieve its program needs. The school needs a site with development capability, and it didn't find one. That's what the short answer is. That, that's the thing that's so strange about this. So had, this, had the school worked with a better broker, that's all I can think of, who showed them a lot that had, let's just say, 20,000 square feet of development capability, and it came to us and said, you know what, 20,000 just isn't enough. We really, based on our programmatic needs, need 40. Then the board would be... 40, oh my God, 20,000 square feet, that's an extra 20,000. You're asking for twice what's allowed on the zoning lot. Maybe you should put the gym in the cellar so you're not taking up so much floor area. Then we'd have a conversation, right? But here, you're asking for 100% of the floor area for the zoning lot. So it, I, I can't figure out how to get my head around this. Again, I think, <laughs> no, I, I, think, I think the point is that whether someone's seeking 20,000 square feet or 20 plus thousand square feet, they're still seeking relief. There's a certain line of precedent the board is. I think what, okay. what we are trying to get at is. I think we do. Understood. You, have a, you are <clears throat> permitted to build something and you're asking for relief for that additional here. You're not permitted to build anything. anything. And you're asking for something to be built, period. And that's where the, that delta is a big delta. Right. We understand. Huge delta. Impossible delta. Okay. All right. So I think you understand us. You're welcome to figure out whether the courts have ever dealt with anything like this, because I doubt that the BSA has actually 
Never you need to help us get over that first. Yeah. We understand. Okay, we think so, we can. And I, there's a lot of people here, so we should hear from the public. Yes. Um, and we only have 40, 54 minutes left to do this in. So, so if, everyone, yeah. if, if I may, if I can first invite the headmaster to just briefly address the board. I think it's important to understand um, who the school is and what they're looking to do and why this community. So because important. it's 806 and we are going to be kicked out of this building so it's not even an option for us to extend this mm -hmm. it's not really relevant at the moment what the school's programmatic requirements are and by the way you submitted a programmatic need analysis and we talked about it briefly in yesterday's review session i would suggest that um, when we get if we get to the point where the programmatic needs are relevant here then let the let the the master. school, the headmaster, yeah. speak to this. But at the moment, we really that's do a fine need point. To, okay, but there, there's another speaker I think who will address um, non programmatic needs issue in terms of the search for the site because clearly that was an issue for the board as well. How they got to this location? No, 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 no. Actually, so it isn't provided. It's, so it was already provided. The broker explained how they picked the site. And my only question, which is more rhetorical than it is actually directed at the broker, is how in the world could they sold, show a site to a school where it has zero development capability? And, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a response rhetorical. for that. But Understood. I, but it's not something that could really be explained other than that the developer said, try it, getting a variance and see how you do. Um, uh, that, that's all. So really, because there's so many people Let's from the public, on. And they've been waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for hours. And you know we'll be back so we can continue this conversation. Understood. You're going to be submitting materials. Feel free to submit all those materials that explain those points that you would like the testimony from your constituent, your particular team to make. And so let's hear from the public because I think there's an elected official, though. Is um, there sure, official? elected official. Speak? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We can speak first. Please. Representative. Yeah, representative for the elected. Please state your name for the record, please. Sure. My name is Daryl Oliver, and I'm here tonight representing Councilmember Lori Cumbo of the 35th District in Brooklyn. Good evening. I'd like to read her testimony on her behalf. Good, good evening, neighbors, colleagues, and thank you for this opportunity to testify. As your council member, I proudly represent the 35th Council District including the neighborhoods of Fort Greene, Clinton Hill, Prospect Heights, Crown Heights, and parts of Bedford-Stuyvesant. We're a beautiful group of people representing the diverse ages, backgrounds, and cultures that make the city of New York and the borough of Brooklyn an awesome place to live, play, and work. We've seen many friends and family move away during rapid waves of gentrification and massive displacement during this long, drawn-out housing crisis that, quite frankly, we're still in. What has continued to stay consistent is the love that we have for our homes, streets, parks, institutions, and neighbors. 32 Lexington Avenue sits firmly in a residential low-rise area. The block and the surrounding environs is composed of a diverse housing stock of lovely brownstones, historic row houses, frame houses, small medium-sized apartment buildings, and ultra-small co-op and condo buildings. The character of this neighborhood is both historic, modern, and nearly every res residential building in this catchment area has a height cap of approximately five stories tall. But our neighborhood is under siege. And with the vertical boom happening in areas in downtown Brooklyn near Atlantic Avenue and Fulton Street, developers are moving into residential neighborhoods and slowly changing the landscape. We as a community have seen developers who are not shy about constructing towers that are out of scale with surrounding structures, but here at 32 Lexington Avenue, I cannot express how gravely opposed I am of a 10-story structure being erected in that location. In addition, the shadows that were cast on the surrounding structures, especially at 15 Quincy, these variances at the degree would block all natural sunlight and privacy on the back of the property. This would be an ironic situation since 32 Lexington Avenue was part of a community, community benefit directly tied to the affordable housing project at 15 Quincy. Mm -hmm. 
At the New York City Council, we have a land use division that provides factual information on projects. After further in investigation into this matter, they had shared with my office that a project of this nature is extremely rare given the magnitude of the variance. They also shared that this type of land use and zoning change would normally happen through the ULIP process, but acknowledged that 32 Lexington Avenue plot of land is too small for ULIP. I am requesting that the BSA board members take special attention to the various concerns that the community has about this project in order to make the site truly be a community benefit, responsive to all the various inhabitants of the neighborhood. Currently, the building proposal is not a community benefit, but rather a detriment that will set a precedent for developers to build out of scale structures. I was disappointed to learn that the building height, comp the building height comparable used in this project was taken from numerous blocks away as far as Fulton Street, which happens to be one of the busiest commercial, commercial corridors in central Brooklyn. Now, we're not against Unity Preparatory Charter School of Brooklyn. We're against an out-of-scale building on a residential block and neighborhood. Here in this district, we believe in high-quality educational op options for families. Unity Preparatory Charter School of Brooklyn, we recognize the need for a home for our children. We understand your position that you deserve space. However, the location of such a building overlooks the tremendous environmental safety and quality of life criteria that is at stake for these residents. It's without saying that a building of this magnitude will likely cause several negative byproducts. 32 Lexington Avenue is between a very busy thoroughfare, which has Claussen Avenue on one side, that has a tremendous truck traffic and car traffic, uh, delivery stops, bicycle activity, and on the other side, Lexington Avenue dead ends onto a one-way street, Grand Avenue. In April of 2016, there was a tragic accident and cyclist Lauren Davis was struck and killed at Claussen Avenue at Lexington Avenue. So traffic congestion is a problem in this community. And what many people don't realize is that traffic congestion affects the, affects the lives in ways beyond the traffic beyond the issue of traffic alone. The quality of our air suffers because of vehicular exhaust, leading to high asthmatic rates in these neighborhoods closely to heavy concentrations of vehicular traffic such as downtown Brooklyn. Additional people, including 500 plus students and other 100 or so teachers and administrators at 32 Lexington Avenue, would become a hot spot for noise and air pollution. Lastly, Several constituents have raised concerns about the structural damage foundations, foundation challenges a building construction at 32 Lexington Avenue would bring to many low-rise surrounding buildings in the neighborhood. Just to name one recent incident in our neighborhood, about a year ago, a facade of a brownstone in Fort Greene collapsed and it was allegedly tied to neighborhood construction. These variances being requested are nearly two and a half times as large as allowed under the as of right zoning. According to DOB filing, the school building is planned to be 101 feet high, 25 feet higher than the 50 foot height limit in R6B zoning. This school is being proposed to be seven stories high with an extended gymnasium ceiling. It will make the building 10 stories high, towering above everything in its proximity. So I thank you for your thoughtful consideration and I ask you to join me in preserving our neighborhood and to vote no for the variance and zoning proposal on application 2017-23-BZ. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues and elected officials who were here earlier today to represent their elected officials, public advocate uh, Tish James, S State Senator Montgomery, and Assemblyman Mosley. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, now we'll take um, speakers, public speakers. Oh, oh, opposition sorry, there's council. opposition council. I'm sorry. Thank you so much for waiting and your time. Thank you. Well, good evening. It's rare to say good evening here. Uh, my name is Jesse Mazur. I'm a member of the law firm of Fox Rothschild. And we're appearing on behalf of 38 Lexington Avenue. And the evening is late, and your patience, I'm sure, has been tried beyond belief. So we submitted on October 31st. A letter to you uh, explaining our 
objections to the application, and there are numerous technical objections we raise, numerous mistakes we believe in the application, deficiencies in the environmental review, and the evening does not allow that to occur. So uh, we, we'll, we'll spare you the repetition, and we know you read these things carefully. Two points, and only two points I wish to make. What you're seeing tonight, in my opinion, is taking the Cornell deference and turning it on its head. You're, you're literally in a position where a developer, and this is a developer, the school is a great institution. Nobody's opposing a great institution. But the developer here, the landowner, is actually double dipping, selling his property twice. This is, you know, if Zero Mostel was alive today, he'd be smiling at this application. This is the producers all over again. It's a double dip. That's the first issue, and Cornell cannot stand for that. It's a precedent that we cannot, any of us, live by. The second point is the height of this building cannot be overstated, will obliterate what was done in 2007 by the careful work of the community board, the council member, the city planning commission, the department of city planning, the entire city council, in creating a zoning framework for this area. And allowing a building of a, over 100 feet where the height limitation is 55 feet obliterates that in a context. The Cornell deference does not allow you to do that, nor should it ever be allowed to do that. This is an impact in a community that cannot be overcome by just saying a deference to a not-for-profit, a deference to an educational institution. I think either one of those issues make this application fatal and require your rejection. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. But you know what? Since that's what you're hired to do, if you could um, brief these two arguments about Cornell deference um, supported with case law would be very helpful. You're concerned I don't have enough work? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we will do that. Right. Thank you. Okay. And good night. Thank you. People go home. Thank you. <laughs> okay, now take um, testimony from the public, and unlike these prior two, um, we have three minutes, and please up. honor the the buzzer because we are literally going to be thrown out of the building. You can all line up all along yeah. the ramp. Yeah, so please. One yeah. after the other. Right. But and so yeah, come to start. the podium, state your name, and listen when the buzzer rings. That's the end of your three minutes, and proceed to the next person. Okay. Um, thank you so much. And after you. State your name, please. David Moore. And after you mentioning that, I would like, actually like to ask for three and a half minutes. <laughs> Um, it's so. three minutes, and we will enforce it because look at how many people there are. Yeah. So let's yeah. get going. Do your best sure. to we yeah. won't yeah. get, get out of here. Won't. Yeah. Won't. Uh, so yeah, I have, uh, my name is David Moore, and I'm a resident of 15 Quincy Street, the same lot shared by 32 Lexington, the address of the proposed charter school. I am also the president of the 15 Quincy Tenants Association and a member of the Clexi Block Association. First of all, I'd like to thank the members of, B of the BSA for hearing our grievances today. I'd also like to thank Councilwoman Lori Kumbo and Public Advocate Tish James for both coming out to past Community Board 2 meetings to express their opposition to this project, as well as other community leaders who have, are not in favor of this. Uh, and just, we've been here a long time today. Could those opposed to this real estate deal and out there please raise their hands? And there were a lot more people today that were here that left because of the time. So I just want just that. Curious, I want is that anyone noted. in favor? From the community? From anywhere? Anyone in favor? Okay. Yeah. Four? Okay. Um, so the developers behind the Unity Prep Charter School proposal lied to members of Community Board 2 and to this very board seated here this evening. Uh, months ago, the developers told Community Board 2 that they had done outreach to the tenants of the very building where the school is planned to be built, an already overbuilt lot. The, the developers had also told CB2 that they had notified our neighbors of the project. Uh, they did none of these things. The first we, the tenants, learned about this planned real estate development was through the internet. No one reached out to us initially. We had to reach out for more info ourselves. Months ago, we rushed before the community board just before they were about to cast their votes. CB2 had been lied to by the developers. As of today, these same developers did not notify our community about this very BSA hearing tonight. Uh, if they told you that they did notify us, then they have lied again. This pattern of lies and sowing mistrust does not bode well for any proposed development of theirs. 
You have received our petition with nearly 500 signatures and about 80 letters of rejection for this, this project. Here is our 500 signature petition. Uh, no one who lives where I live wants this. So here's mm -hmm. the petition here, it's almost 500 signatures. Okay. We have another, I forget how many already, from previous submissions, right? Okay. Uh, in order to grant a variance, the Board of Standards and Appeals, according to its own rules, must find that one, the variance, if granted, will not alter the essential character of the neighborhood, and two, the practical difficulties or unnecessary hardship were not caused by the property owner or its predecessors, which we've already discussed this evening. 15 Quincy, where I live, was already overbuilt by the original developer, Justin Stern. Now he seeks to overbuild Done. even more. Okay. Has Mr. anyone Moore, looked sorry, into exactly? We have so many people, and we well, would someone out there like me. to donate? Uh, okay, okay, thank you. Good. All right. Go. Has anyone looked into exactly how Mr. Stern retained the right to build this new charter school? The question needs to be answered by the media, community board, and BSA before moving forward. We need transparency. Somehow, Mr. Stern obtained the rights to continue to build on the parking lot of a site that had already been overbuilt with affordable housing units. These units were originally supposed to be housed within the Torrent, the luxury condo tower at Myrtle and Flatbush in downtown Brooklyn. My home, 15 Quincy, is the poor door for the Torrent Tower, though the developers chose to build this poor door miles away. These same developers seeking variances today have already received a 421A tax abatement to build luxury condominiums. They are now seeking to double dip by collecting rent from a new building on the same lot which has already been used as the off-site poor door for their luxury condo tower because they wanted as few affordable housing renters living at their luxury site as possible. In closing, it's outrageous and greedy, and this needs to be reported. Members of the BSA, we, your community, ask you to vote no on this sweetheart real estate deal. Enough is enough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. If you can please, please hold your no applause, no extensions. Uh, my name happen. is Alex uh, Gross. I live in the area since 1986. Uh, I live at the corner of Plaza and Lexington. And what I enjoyed from the 15 minutes I've been sitting here is that I could translate your technical terms into reality just by me looking at the corner from my house. Traffic is awful. There is trucks coming from Bedford Avenue into Classon Avenue, also from Eastern Parkway. Everybody goes to the BQ in the morning. It's crazy. The exit from this proposed school is really narrow. It's like you can make a right. It's a dead end. You can only make a left. I'm having trouble as it is with my van today to make that left when sanitation is there, and I imagine when a school is there with 500 kids, what other vehicles that will bring into that corner? So that's number one. The lot, I'm not an architect, I'm not an attorney, but you go look at that lot, and it's a tiny lot. Why do they want to do that there? I mean, why not to look, like you said, for another location? It's a bit incoherent what happened here, a bit of a chutzpah. And they don't want to listen to us. We, we met a few times, and, we comp and they see we are a community, and we see that we care, and we see they, I mean, we waited eight hours today, and we don't want the community ruined, and let's find them another lot. We all have kids. My kids went to school too, and I love my kids, and I love all kids, and let's go on. I mean, do not ruin the community because of your school. There are other places for a school. Thank you. Next. Thank, Thank you. you. Next. <laughs> <laughs> You're hired. <laughs> okay. okay. State your name, please. Hi. Um, I'm Kit Van Dalek, and um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm here to express my concerns and opposition to the variances that this application has requested. I've lived in Brooklyn for over 15 years and own a house three doors down from the premises. Our home is a single family, two story house that's 27 feet in height. It sits in between a townhouse about 30 feet in, 38 feet in height. 
On the other side, there's also buildings that are two feet in, uh, two stories in height. My husband and I are architects and have our office in the neighborhood, and we've practiced in this borough for as many years as we've lived here. Funny enough, we've always loved this block. We've loved the scale, we've loved the mixture of typologies, the differences and the variations, but it's still a small scale neighborhood. Um, first, I just want to say I'm, I'm not against the school or program of a school. I value a school in any neighborhood, but as an architect, I also value positive development. Because as we all know, building once built is there for a long, very long time. So positive development is beneficial, not negative development that contributes to non-compliance. So if the developer has intended a school program, it should add to a community and be a positive contribution, both physically and programmatically. And I don't see that yet. I see a giant building bulldozing both my neighborhood and zoning regulations on a basis of a program. So you, you're pretty clear, as you can see on the graphics, this building will be huge. It's 102 feet high, and it's next to you know, fairly small scale buildings. I mean, that's a huge variance to have or get. But I think huger than huge is the point that you made earlier about granting development rights to a property that has no development rights left. So sure, maybe they say we had thought about making a school back in 2006 or whatever, but it's 2017, so there are no development rights left, I believe. So I urge the Board of Standard and Appeals to uphold the current zoning regulation set to maintain scale and character for Clinton Hill, because if granted the proposal, we ignore the very premise of the rezoning established for our community as well, allow development where none is permitted. The de developers demanding that the zoning and character of the neighborhood make way for something that is plainly out of context. So this one singular program can function and that another, the developer, can profit at the disservice of my community. A specific program cannot ignore the fact that it's part of a physical fabric and part of a neighborhood. What makes a successful project is one that is respectful, positive, and not forced. And this is obviously forced. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, Next speaker. speaker, please. Hello. Uh, my name is Jake Algania, and I work at a commercial real estate firm, TF Cornerstone, during my day job, and I'm on the Unity Board at night. I'd intended a longer sort of story about how we tried to find a school for many, many years. We'll submit that all in testimony, but I just want to address one point that came up in the, the Q&A earlier, which is basically like a, a broker didn't find this. We had a broker for a long time. We couldn't come up with anything that was economical. And then we were introduced to Justin through a, you know, he's speaking at a public panel and found that up at the site. So the reasons we are unable to find anything is because the supplement that came in from the state funding is not nearly enough to cover, A, a market rent in this neighborhood, and even more importantly, the cost of construction or to, uh, rehabilitate an existing use to, be, to become a school use. And so I'll just hit a couple of those statistics. For one, uh, in my day job, we deal with the school construction authority often. They have average about <clears throat> 140 square feet per pupil. We built the school down to 105, 100, 105 feet and hope to sort of compress it even further. At 140 square feet per, per pupil, it equates to $20 a foot in rent. Definitely not enough to afford anything, especially where residential is a possibility. At, uh, at our density, we get a little higher, but still nowhere near the $35 a foot that's market. Beyond that, it costs about $200 a foot to retrofit an, ex retrofit an existing building to become a school. That's about a $7 million, at a minimum of $7 million capital outlay for a school. There, just, there aren't landlords who are willing to do this. We want a 40-year lease, but still nobody's willing to take on a below market rent and a huge DI subsidy for a 40-year lease to a school. It's just not out there. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the why we're uh, you know, throwing ourselves at the mercy of the BSA to try to find the ability to make schools in a city where they're just, otherwise they're not going to happen. That's called a rezoning. Right? Um, and I, I will say one other thing that uh, in terms of community's opposition, you know, I, I hear, but in the past they've mentioned that there's other opportunities, there's other sites, we'll show them to you. Nothing has ever been forthcoming. Mm -hmm. There really aren't. 
we, we see a lot of schools here, a lot of schools, and they all have these kinds of difficulties in terms of finding space, but nonetheless, they find space where there's development capability. So New schools being built? New schools mm -hmm. being built. Okay. Next. Next, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go. Okay. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm Nicole Thompson Adams. I'm a resident on Classen Avenue. I've been a resident since 1999 on Classen, and I've lived in Fort Greene, Clinton Hills since I was much younger. Um, I say that to say I've had my children and everything um, when there were no good schools, quote, quote unquote, no good schools in Clinton Hill, Fort Greene. We, you know, we jumped on the the charter school bandwagon, um, which we hopped off later on. I won't go into that part, but I'll tell you, it will affect my home. It took a lot for us to scrape together every dime we had to buy the home. Um, um, I'm now a widow and I live in the home alone, and I, uh, or with my two kids, or you know, college age people. Um, I have to say that our street has become much more busy. Class and as the neighborhood is gentrified, Class and Have Avenue has become very busy. We have bikers, we have big giant trucks, we have so much happening. When they are building and digging a hole, your house will shake. Um, I, from what I know, and I'm not an architect, how far they'd have to go down to even get the scale of this building up would shake us to our core. I mean, we've, we, we're going through that again and again and again as more people are able to build on the sites. The other thing is, is that I think um, the developer thought that he could get away with not um, asking the people at 15 Quincy. I think they put the, um, it was affordable housing for the Torrin. The Torrin didn't want to be there. If it wasn't the Torrin, then it was the Oro. Nobody wanted to see um, low-income people coming in there. And I remember when the building was going to be built on Quincy that my husband and I were very concerned. And... Uh, Pratt Area Community Council had a meeting and they assured us that these were going to be great people that were going to be moving into this building and no one had to worry and it was going to be a community effort. The community came together. I was Block Association president and we put trees in and we did everything that needed to be done. When they explained it to us and we said, okay, everybody gets a chance to live well. <clears throat> And we put in trees, and we built it up, and we met our neighbors, and we went forward. Now they want to rip the trees out, do everything, and block these people's sun and light after telling us these people deserve to live well. Wait a minute. What, are, who's schizophrenic here? Is it just about the money? It's got to be people before the profits. This guy already made his money. Should he come back and make more money? And then it's like three-card Monty. You say, oh, the, the, we're building a school for your kids. But the kids are not making any money. They're making money off of the kids. By the lease and how much they get for each child in the charter thing, they're making money. And it's not about our children. It's about them making a dime. And it's not right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Elisa Casado. I live on the sixth floor of 15 Quincy Street. I have a five-year-old boy. We both have asthma. Asthma. If this building goes up, I'm not going to be able to open the window. I'm going to have to buy curtains to close it. I don't need him getting sick over the air quality. What's going to happen? I can't. He's only a boy. I love my son. I love my son to death. He's the only one I have. I'm a single mother. I struggle all the time for my son. If this building goes up, he won't be able to look outside. You know, he won't be able to say, Mommy, look at the airplane. There will be no sunlight in the house. He'll be boxed in. Me is different. But him, he's still growing. He won't have that air to grow. He won't have that time to play and say, oh, look at the snow. Mommy is snowing outside. Mommy is raining outside. He won't be able to do that. And then if I keep the windows closed, it's going to be stuffy in my house. He'll have no air. I have to go and get purifiers and everything in the house, raise up my electricity just because 
I can't open and get fresh air or anything for my son and living in the property. I've only been there three years. And during the summertime, it's hard not to have your windows open and curtains open to get that sunlight. Fresh sunlight and air is crucial for a developing child, for anyone at that reason. And I don't want nothing to happen to him. Me, as we all both suffered from, from asthma, he was born with it, just like I was. I already had two attacks in the summertime because of construction. He can't sleep at night. He has to put his machine on. I have to give him sometimes because he can't sleep. This is going to be pure, just terrible air quality, especially for... I live on the sixth floor, so imagine the people who live on the first and second floor. If this building goes up, what about also our emergency exit? It goes right onto the emergency exit of, the, of our building. If it's a school, fine. I'm not against the school. But if you're going to have that, then the garbage also, I understand, the schools always have to bring the garbage to the back of the school. Where is that smell going to come up to? Especially for the people in the building, especially for the people who live right there on the first and second floor. There's no way it's going to be pure for the people who live there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please state your name. Hi, my name is Rakia Webb. Community. This word brings to mind a tight-knit web of people who care. Understanding, understanding that what I do affects the men and women who stand beside me. We, and by we I mean the people who make up the community, learned of this proposal accidentally. An article surfaced, and by this time there have been several meetings concerning this construction with, without and under the noses of my community. This behavior feels malicious as the lot will be behind my home, 15 Quincy, a low-income building, and I'm one of the tenants who live on the second floor. This behavior is also indicative of the character of the people who have us here today. This also inspires the question, what are the real motives and the whispered agendas no one is saying aloud? Do the parents of the children of this, scar of this charter school, are they aware of these things and what's really going on? What are they being told? Community isn't the driving factor for this proposal, and that's clear. What happens to my privacy, my safety, my peace of mind, my health, my well-being, my voice? Where would the garbage go? Am I being taken advantage of because of my so-called class status or my income? Why don't I know the answers to these questions? What happened to honesty and transparency? What happened to following city guidelines and zoning restrictions set up to keep the neighborhood safe and genuine? Restrictions for zoning and not presumptuously moving forward in a privileged manner, unconcerned for the families and thus the generations of people who will follow and who will be neg negatively affected by all of this. This isn't community. Community is finding the right space for our precious children to learn. Thank you. Please vote. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, I'm Tracy McMillan. I'm a resident at 15 Quincy. I've lived there since the building opened in 2008. Um, just to give you a little sense of who we are in the building, because I know we keep talking about how we're low-income folks. So I'm a journalist. I come from a working-class family, and I cover low-wage work and welfare. Rakia, um, who just spoke, she is a therapist at a hospital, and she grew up in the neighborhood. Uh, David is a book author, right? All of us are able to live and work in this city because we have an affordable place to live, right? New York increasingly doesn't have room for people like us who are making, you know, very modest amounts of money. And we're able to live there, which is great. And then to have a building proposed there by folks who say, oh, well, we checked with them and so on and so forth, and they stand up and they lie and as if we don't matter, right? And I think that increasingly we're hearing that from a lot of communities, right, that the working class and like lower income communities don't matter in this city. And if you have a fancy Ivy League degree and are running a charter school, you can just stand up and say, well, but the kids, the kids, the kids, we love the kids, and they forget about us, 
And so that's, I think, what a lot of our concern is at the building. I know that they've made some proposals about saying, oh, we'll give them some shades, we'll plant some landscaping. But the people that are on the backside of our building deserve to have basic air and light the same way it was when we moved in. Right? Nobody would turn to somebody on the Upper East Side and say, well, you know, I know that you had light and air in your building when you moved in, but we're just going to take that away right now. Right? That wouldn't be considered appropriate to propose to residents without even addressing them. And that's what's happened here. Um, I know you guys have a lot about the, the legal stuff, and you'll figure that all out. But this is a time, at, le at least in my neighborhood, right, where like there's an institution coming in and basically saying it doesn't matter because you're broke and we'll do whatever we like and we're going to parade a bunch of like parents who need a place for their kid and students who have very heartrending stories and we're going to try and say that like these grown up adults who couldn't live in the city without this building they just don't matter as much as the kids whose school we want to build and I, I trust that you guys can make a smart and intelligent judgment about that but for me it's just really problematic to to be told that you know me and my my neighbors don't matter because we don't make enough money. Thanks. Thank you. Next, Next speaker, speaker. please. <clears throat> um, good night. <laughs> um, <I'm>, <laughs> correct. <laughs> um, I'm a parent. Tell us your name. My name is Trudy Sandy, and I'm a parent of uh, one of the students at Unity Prep, and I'm here to um, in support of the other parents. And I can assure you, I don't know anything about the building planning part but parents have we have been we have known about the building that was promised to us when our children entered school so we are aware of what's going on um, we our children won't ruin the neighborhood we you know we they're just kids that want to place a new school a new state of the art so many kids go into these refurbished schools um, and they're 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 in there in an old school building, but we just want to give the kids a chance to have something new that was told to them at the beginning when they first entered the school. And I mean, I'm just considering, I'm just asking you that you consider a parent's perspective of having a child that it's right, right now they're in temporarily in a space, Brownsville, that's out of the loop of where most of the kids currently live and we're also low income and middle income families so I'm also a homeowner so I understand the whole aspect of wanting your space and wanting your property and I see gentrification I mean we live in Brooklyn so everybody would see that but just taking the parents perspective as well as the students um, perspective of just having something new and um, something state of the art for them so they don't have to keep using refurbished things. Thank you. Thank you for your time and get home Thank safe. you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Last speaker. Can't. Honorable la chair lady, members of the board, board tell of standards and tell, appeals. Tell us your name she, first, please. My name is Eva Brown. I speak with my spouse, Alvin, in objection to this application. We are retired senior citizens, and we live in apartment 6C, 15 Quincy Street. We are in the parking lot. The applicant's Unity Charter High School is proposed. The applicant also said that he heard us, but has not changed a single element in his proposal. He has also ignored the publicly express concerns and offers of our elected representative, the public advocate, and council member, Laurie Combo. Our apartment is one of the 24 with the only windows in the bedroom and the living area, forward facing directly onto the back of the proposed 102 foot high school tower, now 45 feet away. The school building will effectively screen natural daylight from our apartment. I know I will be forced with an additional rising cost in my electricity bill to keep lights on continually in, my, in our apartment day and night, no longer able to enjoy the natural light forever. We do live on a fixed income. What will become of our quality of life? privacy issues from a building teeming with 400 high school students? Are we going to be living in a solitary confinement? I wonder. 
One's home should be heaven on earth, not hell. Quality of life in our golden years is a necessity. We need clean air and no noise pollution, which creates hardship. Zoning exists to withstand exploitation of those who wish to unjustly enrich themselves, seeking in the name of education to overbuild on a site which we are cut off with no mutual relationship and contributions. To permit this project to continue as will be compounding error upon error, egregious discrimination upon obvious segregation. We would be a welcoming neighbor to an establishment which demonstrates transparency, is proud to play by the rules, and offers a win-win situation, but not to an entity that seeks self-serving and intolerable concessions for worthwhile projects solely for its own gain and without a shred of regard to the consequences of its proposal on us I'm at sorry, the human and done. community sorry, level. Thank, thank you very I thank much. You. I appreciate thank your you testimony. So thank you. Okay, Next Mr. Mandel. Week. Oh, is there any more speakers? I think, I think, are we done? We only have literally yeah. 10 minutes. We need to- 847, 847. Yeah, yeah, okay. So is there another speaker? Three minutes is two speakers. You have to speak really quickly, okay? Sorry, but we really won't we be able to close, minutes. finish the hearing. <coughs> My name is yeah. uh, Philip von Dalvik. I'm a resident of um, Lexington Avenue, as well an architect from and working in Clinton Hill. Um, just to summarize what we heard today, A, I'm incredibly proud of the community and the diversity we saw tonight. These are not concerns against, again, a program, but really over um, to establish the presence of a building um, going forward in our neighborhood which will probably be the next presence for the next developer to come in and try to overbuild the same way. I just, we heard a lot about the microcosmos of the street, but in a bigger scale, when we look at these presentations, what this building essentially suggests is a 50 high feet wall on each side of the building, which will never be surrounded as it is in Manhattan or other areas where you can build higher with other buildings. So just picture a building which will be in this statue, basically a IKEA yellow box sticking out being the sign for Clinton Hill. We can't let that um, be the case. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Uh, good evening, my name is Josh Beauregard, I'm Unity's head of school and a resident of Fort Greene about a half mile from the proposed site, our, our prospective home at 32 Lexington Avenue. Um, I want to thank uh, our families who came out tonight. Uh, there are about five of them still here. Uh, they started showing up about 1 o'clock today, and it's been a long day. They're from Brooklyn. It's a work day. It's a school day. So I want to thank you for their support both today and throughout our efforts over the past, it seems like, years um, at this point. Um, thank you. I also want to thank the folks who came out in um, opposition of this project. Uh, and I say that because uh, I, I admire that they care a great deal about their beliefs and what they think is right at this very moment in time. So I want to acknowledge that um, wholeheartedly and just say that um, our intention is to both provide for our families, our school of five years, as well as provide a high quality education to the families of Clinton Hill, Fort Greene, Bed-Stuy, downtown Brooklyn, our home district of CSD 13. And so that is why we opened the school in 2013 and what we plan to do moving forward. So. Um, I sit here tonight a little disenchanted by the, the sort of us versus them mentality, and it's not meant to be that at all. It's meant to be a public school that serves all, both today, but also moving forward beyond the people sitting in this room today. A school is an institution that will last well beyond us. And um, there's not a person in this room, and I, I thank folks for making that case today, that doesn't believe that education is a good uh, uh, goal. Um, with that tonight, I'm, I'm hoping we can move forward and make uh, something happened that is both best for our kids, our school, uh, the families. Again, we, um, 
we wish nothing more than be, become a, a fabric of what is an amazing community in Fort Greene, Clinton Hill, et cetera. Um, I, again, living in this area, um, I feel very blessed. And um, to go to school in an area as special as ours, I think, um, uh, uh, is something we can all work for. So I thank you for your time tonight. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, I just need to understand, we don't have a copy of your proof of notice of hearing. Um, I know that there was lots and lots of submissions, but it, I'm not sure how they knew about it because we don't have proof of notice of hearing. We need to have it's, in the, it's in the BSA's record. We don't, we don't have it in our files. So can yes. you resubmit, please? We will. Okay. Um, and so in terms of a briefing schedule, then... Um, so we could put this on for February 13, um, but that would mean um, Mr. Mays uh, submits. Wait, uh, one, yeah, um, January 24th, and then um, the applicant would submit uh, January 10th, which would give Mr. Mazer two weeks to respond to you. If you want a sir reply, then we have to push it back another week. We would like the opportunity for a sir reply. Okay, so we could also have you submit on January 3rd, um, and Mr. Mazur, one, two, submits January 24th. No, does that work? No, sorry, January 3rd. I get another week. Sorry? I get, I, I get so if you get January 24th, that is three weeks. January 3rd, one, two, yeah, January 20th, and then they don't have a SIR reply is the problem. So then we have to move it. To March. Four, then it's one, two, three for us. So we need, Probably then it's the 27. 27th. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right? Okay. So we start again. So uh, February 27th for the continued. Um, one, two, three. February 7th for the SIR reply. Wait. Um, yes. January 24th for Mr. Mazur's submission. And January, one, two, three. Three or third for your initial submission. What's so, the sir reply? I'm sorry, what was the sir reply? Sir reply is February 7th. February so, 7th. Chair, forgive me. January 3rd was the our applicant it's submission? Your, yeah, applicant submission January 24th 3rd. for the counter yeah, reply. Right. And then. Your um, sir reply on February 7th. Correct. With the hearing down the 27th? That's correct. Yes. May we make our submission in the following week, the 21st, be afforded three weeks as well? Just like the opposition. Only if you want us to keep moving this. I'd rather. I'd rather not. Need March. Time to review it, so then you get March six. Understood. So we'll stick with the previous schedule. Okay. So the replies usually only get a short time. Okay. So just to confirm, January third, twenty. January third. Mm -hmm. January twenty fourth. January February seven. And the hearing February. Thank you. Members of the public are invited to attend the second hearing on February 27th. It will be and submit written. It'll be in the day earlier in the day, which hopefully. conceptually is <laughs> earlier in the day. Um, hopefully, we don't have a schedule like we had today. We don't know where you'll be on the calendar, but we start at 10 o'clock. Right. We won't start in the, late in the afternoon. Hopefully, we'll try. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, everyone, Thank for you, coming. Everybody. It's very important Thank that you, very you much give waiting. us your Thank testimony. You. This concludes the public hearing for November 14th, 2017.